the code change as much has changed. We're now our own standalone department with the city, and we've had a new, new team member join us. Outside of planning two major international events for the first time in three years, we're also balancing nearly 60 events, and we have a multitude of other community investment projects, things such as public art, dining decks, et cetera, that we also work on. And we've spent a considerable amount of time as a team working to update our website and processes. Before I get started, I do want to introduce some of my team members up here. I know some of you probably don't recognize or see them quite often, so I just want to make sure they're introduced. Chris Finney has worked for the city for more than five years, and we're lucky to have his steadfast expertise in our community on our team. Chris is also the facility coordinator for Miners Hospital. Heather Weinstock joined us in January. We literally threw her into the team two weeks before Sundance started, right into the fire. And she didn't leave. She's still here. She still likes us. Um, so she joins us after working for more than eight years as events and sponsorship for the Utah Symphony and Opera. And we're excited to have her as part of our team. Heather is also the filming coordinator for the city. Stephanie Valdez has been working for our team for almost two years. Outside of events, she assists four other departments. However, for us, she focuses on application intake and organization and helps us with a very with multitude of other projects and invoicing. We would literally be lost without her. She keeps us like organized and going. Um, so um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is the role of special events in our community continues to involve. I don't think it's my computer. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, once looked to bolster economic vitality in off seasons, over the years we've shifted our focus to community and cultural benefit and on mitigating impacts. We spent nearly two decades building the event calendar, many of which have become longstanding community gathering opportunities. Changing the event role away from economic to community is going to take us time. It's not something that's going to change immediately overnight, especially in a resort community and it's a delicate balance. Annually in November, our team, as a team, we begin trying to piece together the future calendar. This is a really important time for our department as we do our best to work out any conflicts, potential conflicts that we see on the calendar in advance and begin to also plan staffing and budget needs as the budget process begins. You can find the 2023 calendar in your packets. That's exhibit A. I do have it pulled up if we need to reference it later on. Overall, we anticipate, as you can see on the screen, we can currently anticipate a reduced scale and scope compared to previous years. I do have an asterisk here because it's still early in the season and we get new inquiries and new applications all the time coming in. Um, so we anticipate an increase there. Um, again, this doesn't mean that we're not going to have a busy summer season or a busy event season. It just means that our applicants are listening. They're trying to adjust to the council's policy and standards that the city has instituted. There are also other financial and outside forces changing the way that special event applicants move forward. So a couple of highlights just on the screen to highlight for council. Again, we're expecting right now we have about 58 applications as opposed to 71 uh, last year. Um, when we published this report, we had seven new event inquiries. Right now we have today, we got another new event inquiry. So we have eight. So it, you can see it kind of constantly goes up. Um, we are pleased to continue to stay within the event level limits. So based on um, that criteria and the code, we're, with it, we're predicting we're going to be within event level limits. Um, and then also, I just wanted to make a note of events that won't return. A lot of times people are like, what's not returning and why are all the changes happening? Obviously, there's some on the screen, Car Free Sunday, Autumn Aloft, Wednesday night concerts um, that I think the public has started to know about. But there's a bunch of other ones that I think we forget of the things that we've done. So things like the Olympic celebration last year that we had in Bob Wells Plaza or council swearing in uh, ceremony the YSA Olympic Parade. Those are all things we did that were kind of at one time or every once in a while they come around. So th that's why the calendar shifts. And then of course, council may ask themselves, why is this important? And I think there's a couple of reasons. Overall, again, we expect a reduced scale of, of events this summer, and it doesn't mean that we won't be busy. It just means we're trying to align further to council's policies and goals. Less events doesn't mean less work for the department or any departments. The changes we're making with events take a lot more time, detailed planning and specialized expertise, and a lot more uh, coordination and communication. We often discuss the events that are approved. So often we don't talk about all the time it takes for the event inquiries that are coming in for our department to kind of go through those and vet those out um, uh, as the applicants come in. And then I think it's important events that they're emotional and some of the discussions we have can be really hard. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had a discussion with a potential applicant 
that had an event and she wanted to bring it in here and she couldn't believe some of the code that we had in place and was pretty upset um, when I let her know, hey, I'm happy to have a meeting with you, but I just don't know if you're going to meet our intent of the code. So we try to be really honest up front if it's something that might fit in for our community or not. And again, that can upset some people that, that come forward. Um, so kind of the various areas we're going to go over. Um, as council knows, we made some pretty significant changes in September. However, there's no silver bullet and we're at risk of killing the golden goose. For us, the golden goose is really focused on community and culture. It's also the fun and funk of our ski town. So I've highlighted the code changes that council adopted from 2022 on the screen. Um, these have largely helped applicants and we anticipate the community create a more predictable calendar and reduce the scale and kind of go for the goal that we're trying to target. While a majority of the code and policy changes we've implemented have been successful, um, we really had to kind of stop and take a gut check specifically on the community identifying event category. Um, especially Heather's helped a lot being new to our team. She understands our events, but being new, she doesn't understand them as well as, you know, Chris might for five years of experience or I might being here for 10 years. So that's helped us kind of dive into how we're going through this process. Um, so we really so I'll need, instead of us making a determination just based on the application, we actually needed to make an, a community identifying event application. And our intent and our goal is to have the events fill those out and explain how they meet those five criteria. Richards Recording has, in progress. Um, always held the Noches de Verano concerts. I think those have been on Tuesday nights. They're very small scale, probably about 100, maybe 150 people attend those events on Tuesday nights. The other one is the Beethoven Music Festival, which is a classical series. Honestly, we generally see about 80 to 100 people when those things happen. And then late in the summer when school starts, Wednesday nights will be a jazz series again, same scope and scale. So it's not every Wednesday, a thousand people at City Parks. It's quite quite a different scale based on the application and the information he's provided. Thanks. Um, we're back in action, yep. back in action, moving on. So this is this is just the code, I'll pull this up in a little bit. I'm gonna keep going on here. Our role has also transitioned over the years as in 2015, we took on the 4th of July and over the last few years, Miners Day and Arts and Culture Programming. We currently have three community events in which our department serves as both the applicant and the regulator. Fourth of July position has been funded in part by restaurant tax. The funding has varied significantly over the past five years, anywhere from $5,000 to $25,000. The challenge is that we continue to hear that we don't want to continue marketing these events, but the restaurant tax funding requires advertising outside of Summit County, which we have focused when we've done so on alternative transportation for those attending the event from outside of our community. As restaurant taxes do, I think next week or the beginning of the following week, we just want to confirm if we should pr proceed with that type of funding or consider other funding sources in the city's budget. And then finally, while we recognize that the 4th of July is a national holiday, the 4th of July celebration in which the city puts on is a longstanding favorite event for many locals. As we look to the future, we also considering sustainability goals and safety for our community. We have done considerable amount of research on drone shows as outlined in the report. And before we continue doing additional work, we wanna understand council's goals for fireworks and drones moving forward and how we should consider funding them as well. The next one is arts and culture district property. And really over the last two years, we've worked to implement programming here. We've seen that as a successful program in terms of community participation. We've shifted away from economic goals and in order to continue the programming community use here, we see the need for semi-permanent 
infrastructure. Last year, we had more than a handful of organizations reach out to utilize the space, but lack of basic infrastructure increased costs to those organizations. Therefore, they did not, they were unable to move forward and do the programming. Examples of infrastructure at the bottom of your screen, and we realize there are long other current conversations about what's going to happen in that space, and obviously that's some, you know, also going on at the same time, but we just want to know how to plan here for the summer moving forward. And then finally, the Silly Market started about 16 years ago in our community. They have evolved and been, been willing to make significant changes. Last year, we did extensive outreach also linked in your uh, council packets and surveys with the community. While feedback was split, we understand HPCA does not support a market moving forward. And council in the fall, or actually I think in uh, January, extended the contract um, with significant changes. Um, moving forward, we understand based on that last conversation with council that a majority of the council desires major changes. Those are also listed on your screen. And to be fair, we understand it's not likely financially feasible that Silly Market will move forward with these big up changes. And so really the question here is if the council agrees on the major changes as outlined um, or they desire a market in general, we recommend the next step is to release an RFP and see what type of responses we get. And we just want to confirm if council is supportive of that or if you guys want to have some further conversations before we do that. I know that there is a lot to consider. I have the summary slide up for you all. We're here to happy and happy to answer any questions. But with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And like I said, we're here. All right. So do you want us to take each question one by one or go through the list, every person? I just think because of time, it might be easier to go through the list, but it's really up to you guys. You know, the other option is we could focus one by one and we just might not get to it all and have to come back. But if, you know, we want to try and stay high level if possible. All right. Well, Jeremy, do you want to take a stab at it? Go down the list. Sure. Um, start at the bottom. So <laughs> for, for number four, um, yes, I do support moving forward with an RFP for future market and major changes and working with our community partners and what that looks like, the ones who are especially most affected by it. Number three, arts and culture district. Um, no, I don't support continuing that. I, before I change my mind, I probably have to see the numbers from last year and see how much it's used. It just seems like a lot of money for relatively little upside. And now that we have those area plans in motion, um, it's probably a better place for our focus to be. On civic events, um, don't really understand the first question, I guess. So in terms of like 4th of July, which we apply for restaurant tax and it requires marketing, is that something you want us to continue to do or would you prefer for us to look for instance at city funding so we don't have that marketing requirement for for civic events would be fourth of july and miners day no, I guess uh, time too. probably don't feel like i know enough about it and open to either no that's not an answer but need to know more mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah i don't really understand it and i apologize i it's my first time doing this, so please feel free to smack me around a little bit or give me some pointed direction if you need to. But if anyone has any questions also, I just went straight for the kill. But I didn't know if anyone had any questions. <laughs> yeah. But I don't want to cut Jeremy off. So like, yeah. Well, I can round out number two and then wait for the first one. Um, and yes to drones. I think we're going to have high fire danger you know, people say, oh, there's all this snow, but it melts, it gets dry quickly. It's, I love fireworks, but it's just not worth the risk around here and other impacts. So absolutely supportive of, of moving forward there. And would love to see if we can partner with some of our other community folks to uh, chip in on this and do a joint event, collaborate. I'll wait on the first one and let the questions fly if you want. Can I can I just interrupt real quick? So on A for two A, is that the one that you want to kick the can on to as well? Yes. All right. Thanks. Okay. I'll ask questions. Maybe we'll get some clarifying answers to help us. Um, first one: Do you have a list of Deer Valley big concerts that are happening? Do you do we know those? And if do they um, 
Are those happening on any of our peak days as well? So yes, we have a list. They're still providing us. They have until April because they're in a resort area to give us the full list. I think middle of April to give us that full list, but we do have those, some of those dates reserved on the calendar. Okay. Um, because of the, the history of that event is long. There's, there's two of them as they've been happening for many years. So because they're not a new event, they're allowed to be during peak and local times but they're limited. They've only ever, ever had two, I believe two events during peak times and they're limited to that and they're very aware of that provision. So okay. they're within that scope and not exceeding that. Yeah. I mean, I figure they announce the big names and then there's like a whole yeah. thing and I, I get it. I get that industry. So, okay. I just wondered about that. Um, and then um, I just wondered what, can you just chat a little bit about, it, it wasn't in this in your slides, but you talked about modernizing your website. And so what's the timeline for that? And like, what does this new software look like? I think that that's fantastic that you guys are doing that, but just if you could give us a little snippet of that. Yeah. So a lot of other jurisdictions, they actually have a software. So instead of a PDF application, it like, it's kind of like a little bit like what the building department might have down with MCI. And so understanding that I believe we're going to have to kind of have a new Eden pro uh, with our finance team and lots of other departments. We're trying to get through that process first before we involve another software because the new software that's coming forward might have some solutions for our team. So we're kind of writing a little bit of shotgun with them, seeing if that's app applicable to us or not, but at the same time researching other softwares as well. Okay. And then it'll just, I, I, I know we had some feedback that it was the applications were hard and PDF and such. So this this will be a little more user friendly for anyone. Yeah, and I think events. I think in general, I'm going to be honest. I think applications are always hard, right? Yeah, and a little cumbersome. So the great thing about our team is we're always willing to sit down and go through some of those. And I know some people will think it's ridiculous that they have to check the box that there's not a road closure. But for us to go through with all the departments we do, we really need that information to make sure the event that we're approving is done safely and how it should be done. And again, we're happy to sit down with anyone if they have questions about that process. Okay. Um, and then, um, let's see. So I know that at some point, and you probably can't answer this, and I don't know that anyone else on the team can, but at one point I had heard last year that the county might take away part of that um, requirement of heads and beds. Is there been any, does anyone have any information on that? It's just going to kind of remain how it is. I know that there was a lot of, a lot of people talking about restaurant think, tax grant money, I think not for, having to have that requirement. Yeah. And I think, I think something has to change at the legislature if that's going to change. But um, for now, I think that's the ongoing requirement. And I do think that the Chamber's Sustainable Tourism Grant, which we're thinking about looking at for the drone show, I don't think that requires marketing. Again, just a little bit of unstable funding, but that's depending on where it goes, you know, that's a possibility. Um, and I think that's that's good for now. Yeah. <clears throat> no questions while you're here, or do you want to wait and come back? I, I did have one question. I um, Sorry, the link on mine. Um, to pull up the CEI criteria, the CE, CIE application doesn't work. And so when it says, um, oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. That's why I just wanted to see that list of the community identifying event list again. Okay. I did have a question about that. Can I ask it? Yeah, go ahead. So, what would be Jenny the um, the implication of removing C? Like, are there events that all of a sudden, like a big list of events that become community identifying events that we probably think aren't, or does it just relax the constraint and it allows like Kimball and Sundance to to meet the definition? Do you do you have a sense of that? I mean, yeah, it, it will allow other events to meet the definition. I think our fear is that it's a it's a double-edged sword, right? And so events that you may not think would qualify all of a sudden will. I, I think our strongest criteria we have and the most important criteria we have on this list is A, which is honors Park City's unique community goals, that, that sentence. And how an applicant will have to answer that question will be, I think, really important. But 
you know, it's hard for me, right, Sundance and Arts Festival, I mean, they're community events, they're um, community identifying events, culturally identifying events. But just because the majority of their attendance is from outside of town, I, I think we potentially would be lost if those events went away. I mean, it would it would really kind of damage our the culture of our community. And so that's why this provision, you know, gave me a gut check and gave our team a gut check when we went through it. Um, but again, we'd have to kind of run through the whole list of events. And I think that's another reason we want the events to have to apply. If they want to qualify for this, they need to take the action and do it instead of us just run through every single one. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. I mean, I, that, that is kind of the rub, right? I mean, it, we're, this is kind of targeted at two events that we wouldn't want to use that we think are community identifying events that just don't meet the definition. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you just remove C, um, I'd, I'd be curious to know if that lets in, you know, some lets events through the door of that. Yeah. And I think one thing we've heard is we, you know, the locals or the community want, they don't want people coming from the outside. So this is why we put that in there, you know, so we could, we could do a little work and see if there's a way to rephrase this section to get more pointed at what we want. But again, I don't know, like I, you know, using arts festival and using Kimball, they offer some really great locals programs and local opportunities. And so maybe it's about explaining that and less about the mix of attendance, you know, so it's just, it's just that goal. I also will say that um, as the event manager, I don't know if our intent is if someone's offering free and affordable options for underserved populations, it kind of like you can easily check that box for most events. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think the intent is if you meet that one, you're community identifying. I think we at least have to meet A and then some of these others as well, but I don't know how council feels about that. Yeah, you know, and I, I also, I think we're going to have to get away from using Park City and Summit County and start using Wasatch back. I think most of our, a lot of my friends, a lot of people who have lived here now live in the, in Wasatch County. Um, and so I would, if we do things where we're trying to be local phrased, I would prefer we use Wasatch back. I think that helps us and come, we're all kind of more regionalized that way. questions yeah i was gonna say I'd, I'd like to think that each of these is maybe on a scale and so i don't know if you have like a one through five ranking on a b c d and e but yes, maybe you do. the total score but yeah it, does, it seems like all of them are kind of important but not shouldn't be the deciding factor okay and i will i'll i'll just go ahead and tell council we double weight at the a because again, it's like, you gotta hit that category. It's like, doesn't apply. All right. Can you give feedback on the rest of it? Yeah. Can you pull up the other questions again? Yeah. <laughs> There's... <laughs> it's catching up. Thank you. Tana, were you going oh, through the question? Sorry, <laughs> I, were you talking to, I thought you were talking to Becca. I'm sorry, okay. Um, okay. Um, I'll just, I'll just go like Jeremy, we'll go up, <laughs> I guess. Uh -huh. uh, yes, I do support moving forward with an RFP. Um, I do not support infrastructure or additional programming for arts and culture. Um, uh, yes, I support moving to drones. I am, I really, 2A, I'm still like, I don't know that I, I don't have a solid answer on this one yet. I think I need a little more information or time to think about it. Um, but we'll see what everyone else does on that. And then um, I am fine. Like I said, I, uh, this, this one is hard too. <laughs> this one. Um, so you, so if we remove C, okay. So yeah, I, I think I'm fine with, if you want to remove C, does that answer? Um, yes, and then do you have any thoughts on one criteria versus, versus should one apply or you think all of them should apply? I think affordable, like in D, affordable is pretty um, subjective. Like, I don't, you know, we could say affordable tickets to Sundance Film Festival are $1,000 for someone, but that's not affordable for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I don't know how we define affordable. 
Um, that would be one part I, I think we would have to work on. Um, and, but I do like, I mean, I like A and B and I just don't know, and, I, and E, I just don't know how we, we can define affordable. That's, that's, mm -hmm. so if anyone else has any more thoughts on that, um, that would be good. Sorry, I'm, I know, I, I'm like solid on three and four and I just, one and two, I'm, and I'm also fine with the drones, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> there's just a few, maybe we just need a few more information on the others. Oh, oh yeah, sure. I think I understand 2A a little better now too. So my answer to 2A would be, um, if we're talking about community identifying events promoted by the city, then I'd be fine with not going after grants that require advertising past our area. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then for one, um, I have the same kind of question that Ryan raised, I think that I don't really understand the impact on the surface. I'd be fine with getting rid of C though. I think that would be okay. I like Tana's point about, you know, if we're going to be regional, let's be regional. If we're not, then make it park city only, but let's be consistent right now. It feels like we're in this gray area in between just kind of strange. And, um, I'd go for all the criteria to be honest, because to the example of like Sundance tickets, that's what I thought of first was, mm -hmm. Well, Sundance is important to the community and the locals, but there was a lot of feedback last year around ticket prices and taking away a locals package. And, you know, that could help us work with them on potential future options as an example where maybe they get a fee reduction because they do offer locals options, you know, that are a little more affordable. So I think that answers all the questions, yep. right? Yep. Okay. Now, are you ready, Tana? Or did you hit them all? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Are you ready, Ryan? I'm ready. Uh, uh, on number four, yes. <laughs> but I, I, I would caveat the, that to say that I don't think we should limit ourselves to a market. Um, I, I actually thought um, when we talked about Park Silly last time, you know, Dana, I thought was pretty eloquent um, on that when he was advocating that we continue it. Um, but that the idea that it's this um, place that the community gathers and it's affordable um, and sort of comes together on a Sunday on Main Street in Old Town, um, I don't think that has to mean that we're selling stuff in the street. It could be two bands in a beer garden, right? Like, I, I, I don't think we should box ourselves into like tweaking the Park Silly concept. Um, so I think I would think of it as a, a, Sunday, a Sunday event on Main Street in the and summer. Can I just clarify though? So we're talking about putting an art when, as we've had a conversation about reducing events, we're talking about putting out an RFP for a new event. Well, I think it's a, an, an RFP for a significantly changed event, but even like, you know, just in that, that comment you made, Ryan, I'll admit, you know, what I under, what I heard from council's direction is that we want to move it off of Sundays. And if that's not true, then I don't want to release an RFP saying we want an event. I'm making it up on a weekday if we're still looking at a weekend event. And so if the other option is that our team needs to take some more time and bring a more detailed discussion back to council, we can certainly do that. But we just want to make sure before we do that, that the council is even interested in something moving forward. Yeah, good, good question. Good point. We, we probably should talk about that before we send out an RFP. There's a lot there. Um, so, but yeah, support conceptually. Um, I don't think we should program the arts and culture district um, uh, this summer. Civic events, uh, yes, consider city funding, but curious just the budget impact of that, you know, what, what that costs for those events. Um, support drones. Uh, I, for the CIE category, yeah, beyond the question I asked, um, as long as the is the implication isn't that a whole bunch of events come into the category, then I'd be fine with eliminating number three, or maybe just adding um, language that you know of events of you know such significant that are they're longstanding for so many years that they become part of um, that they become a community identifying event regardless of intended audience or something like that. Maybe judged to be a CIE and give you some discretion, but otherwise I'd say they should hit all the criteria. It seems like those are all doable. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll start at the top. <laughs> so um, I just want to, I mean, CIE is just but one piece to the puzzle of approving an event. It's not like if you don't get it, you don't get in, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's just one piece to the puzzle. It's a weighted decision-making tool. You get, a, you get exceptions if you're a CIE. Exactly, yes. but it's not the end of the day. You don't lose Sundance and you don't lose, but I would I would support adding some language that, maybe some legacy language that said some that just incorporated sort of these legacy events that are community identifying events. Um, I think they got to hit all the criteria. Um, I don't disagree with Tan on, on affordable is a, a kind of a squishy term and it's different for every individual, but I do like the, um, the intention is, is dead on. We want to make sure that we're having community-based events that allow for everybody to participate and enjoy it. Um, nothing that puts Kimball Arts Center or Sundance at risk of being gone to me. I'm not, I'm not going to be in favor of anything that puts them at risk. I think they would come, either of those would be before any council, any future council a number of times before either of them ever fell by the wayside. So I'm not really afraid of this being like the nail in the coffin for any any of those le what I consider legacy events. Um, so yeah, maybe a little update on the language, maybe add some legacy piece in there. Um, but and then they got to meet all the criteria. Uh, to to a let's see. Um, yeah, I, I to me, I'd rather just look for funding inside the city and and not market. Fourth of July and Miners Day outside of town. I think those are community-based events, and we should be able to figure that out. Um, I think there are a number of tools that we can implement to to make those events less about the parts of our state that don't serve alcohol on that day, and a little bit more about Park City and just what we are. So, um, uh, and then drones in general I'm anti drone um, I'm also anti wildfire so I'm down for drones for 4th of July but boy I, I would love it for it to be like a total number of minutes that drones could be flown in the city limits at for a whole year and it gets filled up by that one event <laughs> so that they can never fly around here cuz they're so freaking annoying um, arts and culture district seems to be it just feels to me as much as I would like for that to be an activated area, it just feels to me like it's going to be too heavy of a lift, uh, too much money, too many resources dedicated to something that doesn't have a history of, of working. We're trying to fit a you know, square peg in a round hole there right now. Um, so that looks like it's just going to be a parking lot for a while. And then on the silly market, uh, I agree with Ryan's comments on silly market stuff. Um, with the exception of us having a beer and a band day on the, on Main Street, I'll do that every Thursday at the corner store all summer if you want. That, that We'll offer that. <laughs> um, I don't think that that's the thing that we want. I think we would have a real hard time getting that through with an HPCA saying, like, hey, come outside and buy beer from somebody else. That doesn't really make sense. So it's going to need to be a little bit more comprehensive, but I agree it's a little bit difficult to understand what we're asking for. So that might need just a little bit more attention, maybe a deeper dive into what we're looking for. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, like as, as much of a struggle as, as it's been to, to, to make these decisions around Park Silly, um, that one's really hard. That Like it feels to me like we keep kind of chipping away at these things that give our community funk and feel. And um, while intellectually, I understand how we get to these places, right? We have a divided input, et cetera. Um, it also hurts a little bit to see us kind of have this trickle effect on the funk of our community, things that have received a lot of support over the years. Um, and I consider that a community identifying event, even though it's not heavily, heavily attended by Park City people. Uh, you know, it's got a long history. So that one hurts a bit, even though I know I've been in the camp of like, let's take a deeper dive because we have to honor everybody's voice. 
I do see us losing some of these little bits and pieces that make Park City feel like Park City. Um, so that's just more of a warning that we're losing it. I don't want this to feel like an airport lounge. That just doesn't feel good. So. Well, um, I would like to answer the questions and I'm going to go back and start to, at the bottom because that's where we finished. And I just want to be really clear on this one that the Park City Market, Sunday Market was not um, birthed of an RFP from the city. It's not the city's event. It was an organically formed event of a group of, of locals who came together and wanted to start something on Sunday, create an opportunity for people to get together and have that beer. And it actually started out as more of like a flea market um, type event, but it grew pretty quickly. Um, but when we talk about our community feeling like it needs a break, if it really needs a break, um, then we shouldn't be putting out an RFP for a new event. If we are going to discontinue the silly market, if that's not something we see in our future, then it's time to let it go. Then I'm not going to put out an RFP for something to replace. I, I don't believe we should be putting out an RFP to replace it. I think if something comes together organically, if somebody has a great idea for an event and they want to bring it to us, that's great. But we shouldn't be looking to fill time in a community that says that they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, so it's either, you know, we're feeling overwhelmed or we're cutting back on events. Um, uh, or, you know, there is an event and maybe it can modify itself or I don't know, Jenny seems to think that they won't, but I don't, I just don't think that it makes sense for us to be going out and looking for, for events. And also that kind of makes it our event if we put out an RFP. That means it's something that we, we own and I don't really, I feel like we already own our civic events. I don't know if we need to own another event at the city. So I'm not in favor of us putting out an RFP um, but I might be the only one. <laughs> so um, the arts and culture, I agree. I don't think I, I was supposed to be temporary funding while we got some other things going. And while we're trying to figure out what's going on, I think we should just let it rest. Um, I am absolutely in favor of us um, supporting 4th of July, Miners Day, our city, our city events, and not um, looking for grants that put heads in beds. If there's other grants that we can use to support a local event, awesome. But um, I think the heads in beds for our local events is, is kind of seems like it should be done. And then I am supportive of the drones. Um, and I am fine with the CIA, CI Eagles as they are. Um, and just maybe if you wanted to state that they were weighted so people know um and then having maybe be a, a little bit more transparent on you know if it's they're ranked one through five and you get like a goal uh score on it um so it's not just kind of these are things we take into consideration maybe if you want to formalize that that might be helpful to events to know how that that category is weighed um and that's my thought does anybody else have any Final yeah. thoughts or can I ask a question? Actually, yeah, maybe me think of one. So, what are what are the mechanics of that RFP? Is are we is it an RFP for someone to help us like conceptualize different options or something to happen on Sundays on or whenever on Main Street, or is it an RFP to for someone to come produce an event themselves and their event producers who respond to that? Or had you thought had you thought that far? Well, I would say, to be honest with you, what we had planned is to release an RFP for an event organizer that would have criteria in which uh, was outlined on the slide here. Um, so kind of these criteria, and then the person would pitch if they had an event for that idea. Um, we don't have to go that direction. We could also issue an RFP to have a consultant or somebody come in to help us, you know, with the transition of the silly market or a market or whatever we want to call it. I'll be honest, based on council's feedback that I've heard tonight, it really, to me, it sounds like we need to come back for a deeper dive on this one. Yeah. And so rather than, you know, spending your uh, valuable time, I think we can just plan to, to do that, do a little more work on this one specifically, probably talk with HPCA and some other community partners as well as Silly Market and come back to the council at a future meeting for that one specifically is what it sounds like. That sounds good. Any other questions or thoughts? All right. Do you guys feel like you have the, the feedback? I'm just going to repeat it so okay. I make sure I have it. So there you go. Clarifying goals on the community identifying category. It sounds like we have some tweaks to make. In general, I hear all of council wants the, all the criteria to count. 
maybe a little more transparency with how we're scoring and maybe tweaking language or just looking at that uh, the thing that I highlighted up on the screen. Number two, I hear overall saying that yes, the city should be funding our civic events instead of looking at uh, grants. If there's other grants that don't require marketing, we might look into those. I hear a support for drones moving forward and I hear Max's caution specifically that we don't want drones flying all over the city. And then I would say no on arts and culture district. And then I just clarified on silly market. So that can I, I have one last question on that, on the drone front mm -hmm. it, with, uh, with a, uh, fireworks show and all that stuff going on out at the canyons. I mean, are we, do we have to have that evening? show to me i mean that's sort of a legacy thing but if it's not fireworks and it's drones it, it's <laughs> it can be pretty cool i heard it's pretty cool at burning man can we get those guys to come <laughs> we will release an rfp for the drones and we'll see we can reach out to them <laughs> uh, but no i i i've missed fireworks. i mean i don't want to necessarily always go to the canyons on fourth of fair July. enough it's fair enough game. it's just worth the question like i, I just think it's always worth like mm -hmm. how much do we need right because it just a lot of a lot of nights it's like a disaster on the golf course it's a disaster at the park it's like yeah. it's a full-on thing every time we have an event like mm -hmm. in that in that evening and fine i'm i'm i've been out on the golf course and participated in making that a, a better place and a worse place because of those <laughs> things but i just think it's worth considering right? right do we do we have to have does it have to be all the time all, everything all at once or do we focus on the parade and the daytime festivities and then maybe there's a, a safer place to have a show that makes more sense that's not right up in all the brush right around all the houses in the trees right i, I don't know can um, i well i will say i just feel like some of our big events are disappearing this year and i just this is like one more. So maybe we see how a drone show goes for one year. Cause it's not like we're investing in the drones ourselves, right? A company comes out, they put it together. So we could do it for one year and not lose like out on money. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah. So I just feel like, I mean, I was almost like one more year of real fireworks. There's snow. It's going to be snowing in July anyway. <laughs> Just one more time. Still not on. I think we have support for one more time anyways. Yeah. All right. Feeling good? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have a few minutes before the library. Do you think they're here? Or should we take a five minute potty break? Okay. We're going to take a five minute break and then we'll be back at uh, 430. Welcome person. library board. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here. I think I need to start screen sharing. So let me get this pulled up here one moment. Of course, it's going to take a second and it's not going to show. How do I get to the website? Is that I just no, you had it. So and you report. Have... I've got two separate ones here. Oh, There's the you, annual report. Did you click out of Zoom? No, nope, Zoom should be open there. And then I've got a separate one to share. Which one are you sharing first? This one? This one and then um, the one that's under there. Um, and then the guiding principles. Okay, so whenever you're ready, um, which one do you want to share first? The, the other one, this. Okay. So you can share this one first from here. Okay. So you'll click on this one and share. And then when you're ready, you take this one down and then click on the other tab and share this one. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Hit it. Hi. 
Are you able to oh, see the screen share? Mm -hmm. Make okay. the presentation mode. Can I do presentation? Oh yeah, make it a little bit bigger. <laughs> I'm sure I can, or I'm sure my lovely mm -hmm. Sorry, helper here awesome. can. But it's been like a year, Tana. Do you know how to do that? Do you have those are your new glasses? I got my, uh, my no. Glasses. I got my uh, progressive. We can make them bigger. I ordered my new contacts today. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred percent. Yeah, it's a yep. Oh. Is that bigger? Doing one of those eye tests. <laughs> I had LASIK done like ten years ago. <laughs> uh -huh. We can, lend you can check them out. Readers. We actually do have some in a box for people who need them. So, <laughs> and yep. But the box isn't here. That's great. That's plenty big. Oh, there you go. Dad jokes. There it is. Oh, yes. We did it. Okay, very good. There we go. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. It's worse? No, it's not. Yeah, you're good now. Don't okay. touch anything. I'm not going to touch anything. Okay. Good evening, honorable council members. Um, I'm Adrian Heron Juarez, the Park City Library Director. It's an honor to be here tonight. We have a number of board members with us. Um, I will introduce our board chair and then I will let him introduce the rest of our board. Um, to my left is Bill Humbert. He's our library board chair. And to my left is Debbie Staff Schultz and Seth and Patricia and Sharon. We have, we have an absolutely wonderful board and we are grateful for their service as well as the support of all of you on council. Um, tonight we're going to be giving our 2022 annual report. So this is a report for the time period of July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Um, we have an annual state report that we submit to the Utah State Library. And at the end of the fiscal year, we do that in November. We submit it to the state. They give us back our numbers and then we put it together in January for an annual report to go out to the public. So this annual report is on the Park City Library webpage if anybody would like to access it there. And we invite everybody to take a look when they have a moment. Um, as we start, we'd like to thank some of our, our fantastic folks who support us, um, our community, uh, Park City Municipal Corporation, Council and the board. Um, these are the board members that uh, were on for 2022, Bryn Bateman Lewis, Bill Humbert, Andrea Zavala, Bruce Kazanov, Jennifer Adler, Christy Hoffman, Patricia Stokes, Sarah Hall, and Seth Beal. And then of course, our amazing Friends of the Library group. Uh, the Friends of the Library is a nonprofit that helps us with some expenses for the library by doing fundraisers, including the annual book sale. So we are greatly appreciative of them and everyone else who helps so much happen at the Park City Library. Um, um, yes, let's see, Ooh, light touch. Okay, can I go forward? Okay, got it. All right. <laughs> so some numbers from the FY22 year. Um, we had, and this is coming back out of COVID. This year, we're going to see numbers that are even higher because we're in the middle of FY23. But this is kind of the first year that we started coming back, not all the way, but getting there. We had 2,162 hours volunteered by teens and adult community members. We had our study rooms utilized 4,565 times. The programs that were attended in person by adults, teens, and kids, also and virtual library events were 15,471. Those are just library programs, not people who come use our meeting rooms and things like that. These are librarian generated attendance numbers. We had 122,059 physical and electronic items borrowed from the library. And in FY22, 144,318 people visited the Park City Library. We have a very nice quote here from a longtime patron who says, as a longtime resident, I have used the library as comfort, resource, and friend. And we do hear many comments from the public all the time with similar sentiments about how the library affects them, their lives, and their families in a positive way. 
some nice some nice pictures there too um, setting up for events and our summer slide program where the kids come out and do water activities outside there's miss katrina helping a little one down the slip and slide and then some of the things that happened throughout the year um, we had a new library card initiative in july the state is a we're a consortium library and so we have access to hundreds of thousands of state resources and in order to keep that maintained we needed a longer library card number a new barcode that gives us better security and access so we issued all new library card uh, library cards last year um, in our spanish services department we had a community of friend up. that's going to be a tradition where we celebrate that holiday which recognizes people who have passed away with comments and thoughts and pictures and offerings we developed a strategic plan which we're very proud of and we're going to share with you briefly just after this part of the presentation our strategic plan is now a one-page strategic plan which got recognized at the state level and at the utah library association conference where we presented this to other librarians so that they could adopt adopt a similar um, method we received uh, america's star library awards we have those here to show you we've received star library awards from library journal for three years running last year <laughs> um, these are numbers driven so these are submitted from our state report they are analyzed by library journal and i think there are only two public libraries in the state who received it and one school library um, we also implemented a teen advisory board, which created a lot more teen involvement in the building with consistent weekly meetings, teens giving ideas for programs, weighing in on the things that mean the most to them in the building and helping with programs such as our after hours NASA event. We installed some quiet booths. So not only do we have the study rooms, we have quiet booths. So many people are remote working right now doing telehealth, um, things where they need to be on their computers and have the ability to talk without disturbing others in the library. And so those four booths were given to us as a result of a grant that came from the state and they've been utilized consistently since we received them. We implemented the new sustainability center. Um, if you haven't been in, we actually have a video on the website that gives you a brief tour of the sustainability center and the grand opening on Earth Day, April 22nd, um, 2022 was a grand event with crafts and all kinds of activities and discussions about things that are happening in Park City that are helping us meet sustainability goals across the community. And then we implemented multi-generational programming. So we've always had adult services, children's services, and Spanish services. But a lot of what we heard from the community is we want to gather together as a whole, lifelong learning being important. So grandparents and parents and kids, programs that everybody can come to and enjoy together. And that's been a really big success. Here's some programs of, um, or some pictures of some of the staff of the library. Here's Kate Mapp, our adult services librarian who spearheaded the Sustainability Center. And um, Daniel Thurston, the Spanish services library who created the Ofrenda in the library. There's our whole team there in the middle. Um, the picture on the lower left is our teen group meeting with Brittany Hecht, our youth services assistant in the teen area, which received some upgrades, including a very cool kind of restaurant style booth where they could chat and um, share ideas. And there I am receiving, receiving a different award, exemplary service during COVID-19 uh, COVID for um, what we did during the pandemic with curbside service, online offerings, and all the things that kept the library going, even when we couldn't be together in person. So we just like to thank everybody who supported the Park City Library. Um, it was a year that saw a lot of development, the new strategic plan. It saw so many um, possibilities for opening up new service this is from what we learned during COVID. And we're just very proud to receive the Library Journal Star, America's Star Library Awards. Um, and we couldn't do this without the help of the community and so many other people like our wonderful library board and volunteers who come in every day and make so much possible. So that is our annual report. We were hoping to share briefly just our one page strategic, strategic plan to see what our accomplishments are as well as where we're going next year, which will be the third year of our strategic plan. So let me do a new share.
I know it's here. One second. Um, it is not here. One second. Hold on. Can I ha ask for help one more time? <laughs> it's not on this screen, so how do I get it there? Stop your share for a second. Okay. Exit out. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then it should let us go back in. There it is. There. Okay. So this is um, the one, stri uh, one page strategic plan. It's for three fiscal years, 2022, 2023, and 2024. We did some community work to talk about what the main pillars of the strategic plan would be as we develop this. Um, and what we heard from the community was that user experience in the library was very important, inclusivity, community relationships, and lifelong learning. And then when, within each of the pillars, we developed goals to focus on for each fiscal year. So you see across the rows this way, um, 2022 last year, the big goals that we took on were refining our user experience. We did surveys, we went and saw other libraries, we implemented ideas that we brought back. We became a culture city venue in terms of inclusivity, which um, helps us help people with invisible disabilities when they come into the library. Um, we created these, a sustainability center and we expanded our teen services. This year, we've actively been working on evaluating our service hours and we did make adjustments to those this year. So we're open earlier, more in uh, coordination with the coffee shop hours. And we are starting to see many people coming in during that time. Um, we think our numbers are gonna go up yet again when we look at this year because, you know, versus six people who were at the library at the end of the day, versus the 40 who are now walking through the door. We feel like that was a good service decision. Um, we're conducting a diversity and accessibility audit, which evaluates our collection to make sure we're inclusive and representing many people from our community. We actually are issuing library cards to every student in the Park City School District. We partnered with the school district and on their registration form for the kids at the beginning of the year, there's a place where parents can go in and if they want to get their children a card, they can do that right online with their school district packet. packet. And we actually have a new library card that's child friendly, that's designed with uh, snow scene, like outside sledding hills, dogs and kids and sleds and fun winter sports. And those are coming out very soon. And then we expanded our intergenerational offerings like the, the tea parties and all of the things that we've had going on. The bottom row is what we have coming up next year. So for user experience, believe it or not, we are coming up to being in our new facility 10 years. Uh, that just kind of blows my mind, but it's time to kind of look at um, what's been going on in the, build, in the building. Bill crunched some numbers, and since we opened the new building, we've over, had over a million visitors come through the door. Um, Based on what we learn in our diversity audit of our collections, this coming year we plan to prioritize and look at our collections to bolster any areas that might need more materials for the community. And then we want to explore the possibility of expanding a Park City Book Festival. So right now we're part of the Utah Humanities. We bring authors and we offer many books in the fall. We do one book, one community, but are there opportunities where we could do writing workshops or more things um, possible with a book festival? And then we really want to look at our you Create lab and databases to make sure that the technology is moving quickly. We're keeping up with it. So that's going to be part of our lifelong learning pillar next year. So that's kind of the scope of where we've been going with the strategic plan. This has been a wonderful guiding document. And every time we go to the board meeting, we actually have subcommittees that dedicate work. And each of these people sit on a subcommittee to say, oh, how's that diversity audit going? How are we going to implement that? What's that going to mean for the library for what books we should buy? Um, or getting library cards into the hands of kids. So everybody here has had a piece of these goals, including staff and we're very 
very proud of the work that has been collectively done to bring all of these to life. And then, of course, next year, it being the last year, which starts in July of the strategic plan, we're going to be starting to plan our next three-year strategic plan. So those are the those are our guiding documents. Um, we were we thank you for your time, and we were hoping to just open that up to questions or maybe the board has some things they want to share. I do. Okay. So as you already know, we have an amazing library director. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and these awards reflect not only the work that Adrian has done, it also reflects the, the work that the staff has done. And, and we have an amazing staff in the library. I'm really proud of them. Uh, now, Adrian didn't want to bring this up. However, she recently earned the MPLA, and that's the Mountain Plains Library Association Innovator Award for 2023. And she, she received this because over the past how many years? Your podcast? Since 2017. Since 2017, usually twice a month, she's interviewed librarians, uh, one recruiter guy, and on her library leadership podcast. And these librarians are all over the United States and anywhere else. I don't yes, know. Canada. And Canada. So, so it's amazing that she, she has persisted through this despite during one podcast suffering a concussion. Don't ask me how it happened. <laughs> I can't picture that. I'm a podcast guest. And so far I haven't had that happen to me. One of the things that uh, I'm really also proud of is our board. Uh, I've been on foundation boards and on other boards, and I've never been on a board that was so engaged as our board. And, you know, it's a delight to be a chair of a board like that, right? So I, everybody that's here and then the folks that weren't able to come, I really appreciate everything that they do and have done for the library and um, the, everything that they do makes a difference. The other thing that I want to talk about briefly is, you know, when you have a million people go through the library um, since 2016, there are going to have to be some changes made coming forth. And that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at next year. This year we we're using friends of library money to reupholster some chairs. And really that money should go towards other things other than reupholstering chairs. And so looking forward, we're, we're probably um, during Seth's term as the chair, we're gonna be looking at the library facilities and probably next year and the following year coming to you and suggesting some potential improvements that are going to need to be made. There's another little pet project of mine, uh, and that is we dearly need another full-time staff member as, as a library librarian. And our, our staff is spread very thinly. We have, um, where is it? So since the building was built, we've had over 82,000 people use our computers. It's, I mean, these things are crazy. Um, since 2016, we've had 5,483 programs at the library. And the attendance at those programs has been 150,493 people. The meeting rooms are used constantly, and since 2016, 11,000 people have used them, and 36,825 people have used the study rooms. So we have a lot going on. The programs that we're creating, just we need somebody else 
Um, I know that one of the other board members wants to make a comment and I'll, I'll let that person do that. But as you, as you can tell, we are growing the number of people that are visiting our library and that's including the period of two years during COVID. So I appreciate everything that you all do. Um, it's fun for me to, to be in front of you and I understand another couple of weeks I might be in front of you again. <laughs> uh, but you're a great city council and thank you so much. Good evening, honorable council members. My name is Patricia Stokes. My zip code is 84060 and I'm honored to be a member of the board of directors for our Park City Library. Before we leave, as you consider our budget, I'd like you to just reflect upon something. In the month of February, there were, that has 28 days in it, 1,438 children, not youth, not teens, 1,438 children took part in programs in those 28 days. There is one person who runs that program and supports multiple other areas. I would ask you to please reflect upon that as you consider funding another member of the library staff. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Deb Staffschult and I'm also 84060. Um, there has been recently a city person who well, used to take care of some housekeeping numbers and that's been designated to a library. So I was hoping that whatever that person does now that might free up some money of what they used to do, go towards person in the library. Also, um, that person that we talked about, the children's services, I think everyone knows who that probably is. Um, at two board meetings ago, she had tears in, in her eyes just talking about needing another staff member. And I, I just really wanna keep those children's programs up. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Does council, do you guys have any comments? I mean, I, I always comment on the library because it, we would be sort of lost without it at our household. We have too many books as it is and we bring boxes into you and every time we come in, we leave with more. Um, so thankful and thankful for the um, free late return policy that we put in <laughs> years ago. That's been super helpful too. Uh, <laughs> but you guys just do such a phenomenal job. The library is always sort of surprising me. It doesn't matter the number of years I've been going in there and, and learning something new about it almost every time. If you just take the time to wander around and you can always find a new nook and cranny. And my most recent one, which I knew about the sound booth, but I went in there a couple of weeks ago and there was a, um, one of our Latinx kids was in there and he was mixing up his own raps. And he was like, he put together a whole album and I was kind of sitting outside the door waiting for him to come out because I wanted to hear what came of it. But it, it seemed to me like he was making just straight up original tracks and he was in there by himself. Um, and I just thought that was such a cool thing to see at a library. The kids making, you know, basically rap music for the latin community at our library um just another example of what a cool resource it is so thanks so much for all the work you guys put in and i know a lot of you have served for a long time thanks for continuing to serve yeah short short of just repeating myself from last year just thanks for everything you do and and you do have a great team and um, my kids live at the library and true story, the only negative item in my adult life I've had on my credit report, 2005, <laughs> Durham, North Carolina, I didn't return a book on tape, and they put it on my credit report. Seven years. So 
thank you as well for your free return policy. <laughs> we, we appreciate that out here in the community. <laughs> but thanks, guys. Yeah, well, I am honored to serve as the liaison. It's a great board, and um, I've had a lot of fun with you guys. And um, I was at the library last night, and um, I learned something really interesting that I need to look look into. Um, apparently, there's microfiche of city council meetings going back to the 1800s. So in my free time, I'm going to go and uh, check those out and see if I can you know, maybe they had some transportation issues during the 1800s. We could learn something. <laughs> but anyway, they told me that. And I thought that was so crazy that we would have city council meetings from the 1800s on microfiche. So you can find anything. Um, I wanted to let the community know that in April, this amazing council right here will be doing the Goodreads table. So each of us will have a table um, with our favorite books. And hopefully you guys can come in and learn a little bit more about us and what we're interested in. Um, there's a few of you sitting here who have not done it yet. <laughs> okay. Um, and I really need to learn how to use the virtual reality thing. The kids every Wednesday are like, how do we use this? So I need some training on that. <laughs> but you can play virtual reality. I mean, this is how great our library is. So thank you guys so much. Sure. Yeah, I echo the appreciation for all that you do um, especially you know volunteers on the board and and what you do as the director of the library and the whole staff there um, you know i was actually pretty impressed when i went to go pick out the books for our goodreads table and i made a list of books i'm like eh, they probably won't have these and you do you had most of them um, and a lot of them are, are thought-provoking books and you know i was really happy to see We've talked about how important it is to have that banned books section and um, to be able to, to for folks to come in and get educated on topics and understand different points of view. I just want to give you a big kudos for that because it, it was pretty awesome to see those books on the shelf in a relatively small space compared to, to others. Uh, and yesterday, I actually went there to use the study room, so that was kind of a cool experience. Um, and I'll tell you, it's fantastic. So uh, anyone out in the community who, you know, if you need a place to go sit for an hour or two in between meetings or running around town, um, the service is exemplary. The place was spotless. I mean, it, Wi-Fi worked great. Everything was fantastic. So thanks again. Uh, and I'll just wrap up with saying I'm looking forward to the slip and slide this summer. <laughs> and I promise if you do it again, I'm, I'm in. Good. <laughs> Might be a bad thing, but let me. <laughs> yeah. let me know when you're doing that. I want to do the video. <laughs> yeah. Or we can do it together. Yeah. Hold no, hands. no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will just also say thank you to Adrian and your staff. You do an amazing job and our community is so grateful for you. And also thank you so much for all the work on our board. It's so wonderful to have so many community members that are willing to step up and take these roles. We're very lucky to have you all. And um, I can't wait to go visit the library again. So thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. And I think with that, we actually have a little extra time for for a break before we open it up at 5.30. We'll be back. Thank you guys Thank so much. Thank you all. Including Matt and Max. All right, guys, we're gonna get started. <laughs> Welcome to uh, March 23rd, 2023 City Council meeting. <clears throat> um, we're going to kick up our meeting. Uh, roll call. Uh, the mayor is missing, is not here tonight, but she is excused. <laughs> she is not missing. I misspoke. She is not in attendance tonight, but we know where she is. Sorry, <laughs> that came out wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we're back. It is 5.30. Um, we are going to start with communications and disclosures, disclosures from council and staff. Um, let's start with Jeremy. 
I don't have any. All right. Moving right along. Tan. Okay. Um, I have three. So in the packet under communications and disclosures from staff, there is um, information about the spring runoff preparations. It's been a big question for a lot of people. And so um, I encourage people to take a look at that and also note that April 3rd, we will, there were our sandbags available on April 3rd. Lots of people have asked about that date. Um, great news. We have just received notice that um, we will be able to implement transit to trails this spring going up to Bonanza Flat. And we don't have a date. The date is uncertain, but this will be similar to what we did in November. Um, more than likely, this will be after we stop grooming Round Valley, but more to come on that. And um, we thank the the people who <laughs> said yes. <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember who that is now. Um, okay, and then the last thing is um, I would like to, as of today, resign my role as the co-liaison to the HPCA, which is the Historical Park City Alliance. Um, I would prefer to participate in this organization as a business owner and a building owner versus as a city councilor. So I'm asking the council if there's anyone who would like to co-fill this with, uh, take take my role um, and, and serve alongside with Nan. Is there anyone that's interested? I'd like to. All right. Anyone else or we're going to give it to Ryan? Congratulations, Ryan. <laughs> Ryan you All right. <laughs> Is that is, is that, this an okay oper, oper, okay so um we'll have that on on note that ryan is taking tana's place all right cool thank, thank you. you tana all right ryan hpca liaison i'll be dropping my own liaison assignments next week i didn't know if we do that <laughs> <laughs> uh, and i i have none thank you your honor i'm on the under i'm out nothing um we are working on running an efficient meeting tonight um all right well i actually i don't have anything to report tonight but i would like to say on our staff communications just for the record there is a library coffee shop lease update um a report on incentivizing fire sprinklers in the historic residential structures uh three a communities that care financial fy23 financial contribution a 2022 golf season recap in 2023 season update and uh 2023 spring runoff preparations um and we're going to have oh i apologize and, the, and the, those are the items that are on our staff communications um at this time we're going to open it up for public input. So if you are waiting online, um, please raise your hand. And I think we have a little, do we have the video that we always show? Oh, you have the video? Okay. And we don't have sound. All right. So <clears throat> we often show a video giving a few tips and uh, tricks for giving input, but I will just say we ask that you be kind, courteous, respectful, stay on point, and keep your comments to three minutes or less. And with that, I welcome anyone up to the dais, up to the podium. Um, to give public input, please just make sure you sign your name and um, where your zip code. Hello, uh, my name is Nils Thorgerson and I'm 84060. I'm a resident of Park City here for six years now and I also uh, develop drone technology. So. Uh, I just wanted to come and make myself available to you guys. I started a drone company called Vergero six years ago. And then at the same time, I bought a lot in Park Meadows and built a certified passive house that's net zero at the same time while I was waiting for my engineers to finish working. So um, I have flown for President Biden when he became uh, or when he accepted his uh, victory. I have flown on 
America's Got Talent with Simon Cowell, who too also thought that drones were nasty and noisy and awful until he saw us. And then he gave us the golden buzzer. And uh, I've flown at Burning Man the last two years. So um, I am here as a community member. Uh, I'd love to do stuff in Park City. I'm happy to do it free of charge, not on the July 4th holiday, but otherwise, if you guys wanna do fun stuff, I'll do it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Do we have any hands up online? We do. We have Melissa Mendez. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, my name is Melissa Mendez, and I work in 84060. Um, I live in 84049. I am a board member for the Utah Association for the Education of Young Children. And I'm a program director here in Park City of two child development centers. And I just wanted to call in and talk about the stabilization grant that we've all received from the COVID dollars. Um, I, I just want to make everyone aware that 73% of the child development centers in the state of Utah accepted the stabilization grant. And um, when NACI has polled all of the centers, 70% um, of the centers have said that they will have to raise tuition prices. Um, tuition prices are very, very expensive for families. Um, it, my concern is for families and children always and first. Um, here in Park City, I think, Everyone needs to know that we really do live in a child care desert. The program that I am the director at, we have 237 students on our wait list. I could easily open two more centers and fill them um, tomorrow if we had the capacity to um, the support from the government that we've been getting, if we can continue that support um, I think that we can grow and really support our community. Um, I just want you all to know how important it is. Zero to six is when 90% of the neurons in the brain is developing. Um, we, <laughs> we would like to call it brain, ar brain architecture. That's what's happening right then and there. Um, when you can create positive, um, high quality interactions for children, zero to six, it will um, substantially increase the child's ability to do really well in school. So you've got less special ed going on. You've got less juvenile delinquency going on. You've got, it's more likely that they'll go to college and earn more money in their lifetime. So one thing that we like to say on the board is that for every one dollar that you can put into early childhood ed you will get a return of 13 dollars in the community so i just want to let you all know it's just super important to me you can probably hear it in my voice <laughs> um and that's that's it thank you do you have any other hands up or anyone else if, please feel free to step on up there's no more hands raised online thank you my name is bobby greenfield and i live in 84060 and i'm on the board of the kimball arts center and chair of the education committee and i wanted the council and the public to know that the kimball with park city education foundation <clears throat> brings to our Four out of five elementary schools in Summit, Cal uh, Summit County our art education. This means we had 6,486 creative interactions with Kimball teachers in January and February, alone in schools or at the Kimball. But we are at cap capacity and are looking to expand to reach even more locals and visitors. Educational outcomes and school tests are hugely increased when our students have access to the arts. 
We also serve senior citizens. <laughs> Kimball's Golden Art Club brings lessons to the Senior Citizen Center, as well as providing classes and camaraderie at the Kimball Art Center. We encourage the council to support giving art a home in Park City for all students of all ages and for the future health of Park City. And thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you for standing up today. Was that it? Is there anyone else that would like to give public comment tonight? I think we're good. All right. Um, then we will clo close the um, public input. Um, the next item is consideration of minutes. Would anyone like to make a motion for an amendment? Your Honor, I move we approve the minutes from March 2nd and 3rd, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, next up is the consent agenda. We have two items on the consent agenda. Um, one is a request to authorize a city manager to execute a construction agreement um, with shapeshift terrain parks to redesign and build the Park City Dirt Jump Park in an amount not to exceed $110,000. And the other is um, a request to authorize a seasonal extension for Jan's White Pine Touring Nordic Services located in the Park City Municipal Golf Course <clears throat> through April 9th, 2023. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, and now we will move into old business. <clears throat> the first item is a consideration of an ordinance amending the land management code sections 15 to 13 dash two residential development uses. Um, should I keep, do I need to keep reading this whole thing? <laughs> I will pause. All right, go ahead, Rebecca. Good evening, Council. Uh, Rebecca Ward with the Planning Department. And the item that is scheduled has been withdrawn. Um, this is based on Senate Bill 271 that was enacted by the legislature this year that creates some limitations on municipalities and the regulation of co-ownership. So um, we do plan on coming back April 27th with code amendments that will reflect those changes. Um, I do have a brief presentation if you're interested in the review process with the Planning Commission. Um, otherwise, that's, that's the information we have for this evening. I did want to call out that uh, we have provided a summary on our website and also while the Senate bill does restrict the city's ability to restrict these, um, it does carve out an exception for homeowner associations to do so. Uh, Council, would you like a presentation or are you okay to move on? I don't need to see a presentation. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I think we're okay to move on and we'll um, move on to old business item number two, um, consideration to authorize the city manager to execute a construction agreement in a form approved by the city's attorney's office with VanCon Inc. for the construction of the 9th and 10th Street stairs and a water improvement project in an amount not to exceed $1,423,000. You know, um, while we're getting set up, can I just thank, uh, you know, the planning department put in a ton of work um, on the ordinance and working with the planning commission. And I think it was really good work um, and really thoughtful and you know we're not moving forward with it but it doesn't you know change the, the fact that i was really proud of what they did so um so thanks rebecca and um gretchen thanks for that i concur i concur sure. <laughs> there's no vote there's a lot of concurrence up here <laughs> all right Good evening, uh, Matt Twombly, engineer. Uh, I haven't used the uh, department here before, many others. But not engineer. Oh, thank you. Good evening, Matt Twombly with the engineering. Um, <laughs> so we have before you the uh, 9th and 10th Street stairs and water improvement projects. Uh, this is for an award of contract. Um, I'll just go through a little bit. 
So back in June of last year, um, council was presented uh, the Old Town Stairs history and the Ninth Street Stairs project update. At that time, uh, we were only planning to do two blocks of Ninth Street, um, the first two blocks between Park Avenue and Norfolk Avenue. Uh, during the meeting, council directed us to see if we could do two more additional blocks. The other block in Ninth Street between Norfolk and Empire and the block in 10th Street. Um, at that time, we recommended bidding the whole project, but adding the uh, two blocks as additive alternates in case we didn't have the funding. And if we couldn't overcome some design challenges with the upper block and the water lines. So um, to continue uh, the bidding process, we had to do an addendum to Alliance Engineering's contract to do the additional design work for the water lines and the stairs. Um, so as we got into the design, uh, there are a couple of things, uh, especially the old water lines that were from 1978 in the uh, three of the right of ways. And then there's three water lines in 9th Street between Norfolk and Empire that were concerned to the Public Utilities Department. So during the design, we decided to go with concrete at grade stairs instead of our traditional wood stairs with footings. These stairs would be similar to the bottom right photograph of concrete um, with no footings. These are at the transit center. So we've done them before um, and we can do them. Um, we have other utility issues, sewer lines, poles, uh, power poles, storm drains, and we have future improvements, Park Ave reconstruction and Rocky Mountain Power, they're undergrounding. Uh, other considerations are cross landings for the access to neighbors, neighbors um, existing landscape encroachment agreements, and we'll likely have new agreements at these <coughs> cross landings um, where we might have to add some rock retainage to make the landings work. Whoops, I can go back. Um, so we went through the bid process, did a pre-qualification of bidders, we were on request for statement of qualifications process. Uh, we posted that in as many uh, places as we could on the website, the U3P website, Deseret News, Salt Lake Tribune, uh, legal notices website. Um, and after all of that, we were able to pre-qualify four contractors, but we only had one bidder in the end when, once we did the bid, and that was VanCon. Um, so what's included? Uh, the base bid includes the water improvements. Uh, those will be paid out of the water fund. Uh, then we'll have the Ninth Street Stairs pro um, Stairs project, um, both the two blocks park to Norfolk, those will be paid out of the stair CIP. Um, there are also general construction costs, those will be split. Um, and then there's Park Avenue crosswalks and ADA ramps. Uh, then the additive al alternates with the two additional stairs. So what we have is we have various alternates for council to consider. You can either award the base bid and the additive alternates, the 1423161, or any combination of the add alternates, or just the base bid, or decide not to do it at all. Um, so that's where I'm at. Uh, so I'll kick it back to you if you have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? All right, would you want, <clears throat> well, then I guess we should open this one up for some um, public input. If anyone has any input, please feel free to stand up. Is there anyone online? No hands raised online. 
All right, then uh, we will close the public input and um, in I think awesome job here, right? It's exactly what we asked you to come back with and um, pedestrian safety, getting people out of cars, not gonna do it unless they feel safe and have access. Um, so I'd say go for it, go for the 1.4, get this thing done and be a, you know, infrastructure amenity for the community forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you guys. This is a fantastic project so far. And I do want to um, also let the community know that we have spoken about having wayfinding signs going along with this. So that is something I believe I see a nod in the back that Heinrich's team is working on. Um, the goal is to try to capture people before they ever have made it to this ninth street stairs um, from the ski resort. So. As many people know, 8th Street is a very dangerous street, especially in the winter time. And so if pedestrians have a safe access point to get down to Park Avenue and know that Main Street and the rail trail is right there, that's um, part of this, the part of the reason why we want to continue to do these complete streets. So thank you so much for this. And um, it, so do we, do you want us to like make a motion on sure. one or do you want us to pick one? How are we doing that? Uh, oh. Yeah, Jeremy's already made a, a, said that he's in support of 1.4 or option <clears throat> for going for all um that was in the alternatives one recommended. and two. Oh. Yeah. So that's just so so we would just approve no motion. Okay, just make a motion. Thank you. Your Honor, I move we approve old business item number two. Okay, I'll second it. <laughs> Thanks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, we'll move on to thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Engineering. Yeah. Engin Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll move on to new business. Um, and the first item is a discussion of the health insurance procurement. procurement. Uh, thank you, Council. Give me one second. I'm just going to bring up my presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, Sarah Mangano from Human Resources. I just wanna talk about healthcare benefits and our recommendation for fiscal year 24. Um, in December of last year, we went out for an RFP regarding healthcare benefits. This is our first formal RFP in, in the last 10 years. Uh, we did this RFP through our benefits brokers, Hub Insurance. Um, and we used our current Regents contract as our benchmark for this program for the RFP. Um, in January, we got the results from the RFP and we just we discussed several different topics, both a fully insured versus a self-insured basis for our plan. Um, we had eight responding insurance companies for this plan, and we had the evaluation committee review all of these different uh, RFPs. Uh, in February, we moved forward with a group of finalists, again, with that same uh, committee. We focused both on service, network, and cost for this. Um, and we included budget and finance in these discussions that we wanted to move forward. And we uh, came down to two final carriers. Um, before I go on to the final carriers, I just wanted to talk really quickly about funding strategies. Um, when we talk about funding for health insurance, we can look at a fully insured plan. This is the plan we've currently been on for the last 10 years. What this means is we pay an insurance carrier a fixed cost by per person and by plan. Um, it's a set monthly pr uh, premium. It's perceived as less risk. Um, and these plans are all governed by Utah state insurance law. There's a level funded plan, which is a hybrid plan. And this um, is a version of fully insured and self-insured. It's governed by the federal insurance and it allows an insurance company to both set rates, do claim funding, and has a stop loss premium in it. 
in the self-funded plan, this is perceived as the most risk, but the employer, employer uses a third-party uh, administrator to run the, run the plan, but Park City or whoever the employer is would pay the claims. Um, this utilizes something called stop-loss insurance. We set a rate that we say, if this goes over this rate, um, the stop-loss insurance covers it. Um, monthly payments on this do vary based on claim, uh, claim usage. And this is also governed by federal insurance law. So we did have these discussions about how we wanted to fund our, our program as we've been on fully insured for since, since we started having insurance as a benefit. Um, we came down to the two finalists. These were Regents, who is our current healthcare coverage, and then the other program is Aetna. Are you guys able to see this whole thing? Okay. 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 Um, with Regents, we have a fully funded model. Um, and we, with Regents, we're able to get zero rate increase for the next fiscal year. Um, they offer a cost saving sharing program. Um, we would have continuation of our healthy living program uh, through a paid program for them, which would be an additional cost. They also offer us some basic um, reporting. With Aetna, who is our second choice, we stayed with a fully funded model. We have a one-year cost savings of 500, this is the important number that's of course not showing, but 560,000 plus. Um, we can still participate in a cost sharing savings. Um, it does include the healthy living program. We have enhanced reporting and the other big benefit in addition to the huge cost savings is that we can open up insurance options to our employees to participate in both the U of U and IHC. As we continue to recruit more and more from Salt Lake Valley, having that IHC option for new employees is like extremely important as that's the, the vendor they choose to use. But this means we don't change doctors. We don't change networks. If you are currently on the U of U plan and you like your physician, there is no change. You just change the card you're using. So when we went through the entire selection process, we really looked to transition to Aetna. They're offering better benefits and more comprehensive plan at a significantly lower cost. Um, we'd look to transition to them July 1st um, and continuing with the fully insured options and looking at the cost savings program. Um, we need a 60 day communication plan, which really starts uh, beginning of May. Um, we'd want to make this a very broad campaign in office and to home. We know sometimes primary insurance decisions get made by people at home, not necessarily the employee. As I mentioned, we have that 97% physician match. When we ran the numbers, the people who weren't using the U of U network at Regents were going to IHC. So this actually solves that problem. Um, the last thing is we want to continue this journey to self-insured. Um, we need to look at a couple of things as far as how are we budgeting for the variation in claims, as well as making sure that we can have the proper stop loss coverage and what that looks like. And we'd like to look at that over the next year to two years. Um, but we do think that this is a better plan altogether for us. So um, I would be back on April 4th uh, with a consent agenda item with the contract to approve. But I did want to turn it over if you have any questions, as I know many of you are also on our benefits. I have a question. Yeah. So as an employee leaves the organization with either of these insurances, do they have the option to maintain their insurance once they leave? Yeah, through COBRA, anyone can continue on our insurance. Um, they just pay the monthly premiums in lieu of the city paying the monthly right. premiums. Cool. Thanks. Sure. And that's uh, 24 months. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Concerns? All right. Well, thank you so much for all of your work on this. And looks like we don't have any questions for you. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Next item up is um, a consideration to approve the funding recommendations for the FY23 mental health special service contracts for a total amount not to exceed $60,000. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, uh, council members. Thank you for having me. I'm Kirsten Darrington, grants and budget coordinator 
within our budget department and I'm here to walk through our mental health special service contract recommendations and um, and ask for another additional item from Council. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right, so uh, what I'm coming to Council tonight is to ask for your consideration and approval of the FY23 mental health special service contracts. This is the first round we're doing this. It was kind of a truncated process. And in addition to that, uh, this week we received some additional information about funds that were distributed last year to communities that care. They're now being returned. Um, and it is just over about $50,000. And so what we amended the packet, the packet, um, earlier this week to ask that as part of this discussion, council also look at options for other ways to utilize those FY23 funds that we're getting back. So I'd like to just quickly walk through a little bit of background on the special service contracts, look at our recommendations and then pose uh, or turn over to council for discussion. So some very quick background on special service contracts, which you many of you will be familiar with by now. They basically provide competitive funding to local nonprofits to help them better serve Park City residents. Uh, these are always awarded through a competitive RFP process. And these are reviewed by our special service contracts committee, which has historically included two council liaisons. And again, the new category for mental health was approved during the FY23 budget process. A um, little more background, We're currently we have three categories for special service contracts. We have our regular service contracts, which run for four years. We're in the middle of that right now. Diversity, equity, inclusion contracts, which we just awarded. They're just completing their first cycle. Uh, at the end of this year, they'll open, we'll open a new cycle again for FY24. And then mental health, which we are bringing for you this evening. Um, and just because we've had questions on this in the past, I wanted to put this up here to be very clear that we intentionally run these grants um, and off cycles with each other to help make staff's job easier, make sure we're running, um, we're able to advertise and promote all the categories fairly. So we have our regular service contracts, which are going to come to a close at the end of FY24. Then we'll start the next cycle in FY25. And then our diversity, equity, inclusion grants, along with our mental health, will uh, close basically those contracts will be done at the end of FY23 will relaunch in FY24 for another two year cycle. So I just wanted to uh, point that point that out in the clearest way I could. I know it's hung me up a few times. So uh, with this, diving into the little bit of the mental health special service contracts process. So this application, in addition to asking for what we typically want from special service contracts, they incorporated the aspects of the Summit County Mental Health Alliance strategic plan. So applicants were asked to include one or more of the five goals outlined in that plan as part of their application. Um, the RFP for this opened in mid-December, closed January 20th. Uh, we had some great work from our community engagement team that helped us get out the word. We had some uh, really good traction, I think, with local media. We got um, a few new applicants involved in the process, which I think was really exciting. So I think it was pretty successful given that it was, again, a quicker turnaround time. And a huge shout out to our subcommittee members, which included our council liaisons, council member Tolly and Gerber, as well as the Summit County Health Promotions Director and city staff. Very thoughtful process, very um, great conversation. And, and I feel very excited about the recommendations we're bringing to you tonight. Really quick recap of the budget for this. Um, council approved 120,000 in funding to support mental health services as part of the FY23 budget process. And to break that out more, a contribution of 60,000 was issued to communities that care through the Park City Community Foundation. And that is a, por a portion of that is being returned to the city, um, which I mentioned earlier. Then the remaining 60,000 is being used to fund this round of mental health applications. Then for FY24, so moving forward, the direction is to budget the entire 120,000 in the manager's recommended budget and continue to fund mental health services through the special service contracts RFP process. And finally, after all that, here are our recommended uh, funded applicants for tonight. We have five organizations here. You can see the request column and then the committee's recommended amount in the final column, giving us bringing us to our total of $60,000. 
um, again, really thoughtful applications. And what was I, what I appreciate about them in this process is we let them know upfront that there was a quick turnaround on the spending deadline here, um, that we would be looking at opening future rounds, but right now this is a much quicker turnaround than other SSC contracts and the expectation was to spend accordingly, which all of these applications were done with that in mind, which I appreciate. So we were very upfront about that. So again, looking ahead, um, just recapping, the next round of mental health uh, special service applications is set to open in May along with the DEI applications. And then both would, the plan right now is to award both for a two year cycle. So FY24, FY25. And then the next round of regular service contracts, those applications will open the spring of 2024 and be awarded for another four year cycle. So we're just kind of getting into a group of things. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to council to um, consider the approval of these recommendations and as the actual I, the action item on the agenda, but then also appreciate any discussion on uh, options for utilizing the return from, from CTC and any direction you want to give to staff that we can, we can bring back, we can act on or bring back to you at a later date. So thank you and I turn it over to you. Council, do you have any questions? How much uh, funding do we allocate to the DEI special service contracts? Uh, it's currently uh, 250,000. Okay. And that is the same as our um, regular service contracts. So they have a similar budget. Okay, thanks. And then as far as these requests go, and maybe it's a question for you and the folks who worked on this committee, but um, did we fit it into the box? Like we only had 60,000 left. So we made that decision based on what was remaining or is there, you know, are, are they qualified requests? I guess would be my question. Mm -hmm. We had more, we had more applicants and we ranked and scored them. And those were the ones that came out on top that we felt and we didn't, we gave the top three, I think the full funding they requested and then kind of gave the others partial funding from what was remaining, but um, wanted to give more money to the projects that ranked the highest that we felt like were going to make the biggest impact. Okay. So yeah, I guess that leads into the next question, which is probably answering the return funds point on here. Um, if it makes sense, I mean, you know, we told the community there'd be 120,000 available the way I see the math. You know, we've spent, well, to date, 10,000 now, um, which is appreciated. I see some representation in the room. Then we had the 60K that's recommended. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but again, we only had 60K to work with. Um, how do we get to, what can we do with the rest of the money to help these qualified organizations deliver the programs for the community, right? Um, and maybe before we answer that, can we talk a little bit about the process in terms of the KPIs? So my understanding here is we issue a special service contract. We don't give 100% of the money up front. We give a portion and then there's a checkpoint to make sure we're meeting KPI goals. Then we release the rest and we do that again at the end is that uh, absolutely so what as part and this is written to their contract and they know this up front as part of the application is um they are awarded the funding amount whether it's for full request or a, you know a percentage of that and then upon execution of the contract they are paid out 80 percent of their funds and then once we get halfway through the year or in maybe three quarters of the year we reach out and we say okay we need your mid-year report and we don't distribute the final 20 percent of those funds until we receive those those goals back um and then next year we, we do the same process every year so if it's a four-year grant we'll do that four year four times if it's a two-year grant we'll go through that twice okay so i, I mean i'll just throw out a question slash proposal i guess from looking at the report um you know i i think what we should do is fully fund the extra 500 bucks for summit county clubhouse if big brothers big sisters and saddle of love are qualified requests i'd fund those the girls on the run one didn't reference anything about mental health so that's the only reason i left that out but if you say there was more information and that's a program that would qualify under mental health i'd say do that too um and then for live like sam you know, I, I don't know the intricacy there, so I'd probably look look towards the team. Um, you know, my gut reaction was there's kind of an outlier at that funding request, so maybe fund them at the next top number, which was 15,000 for the other 
two organizations that were awarded that. So if if we did that, I mean, we'd be looking at 23,500 more, which even with the CTC 10,000 puts us at 93.5, well, well under the 120K we'd offered. And um, yeah, the rest, what, what happens to the rest? It goes back to the general fund or something? It goes back to the, it would go back. And then if we wanted to, um, you council could give direction to roll it over to the next year for use, but it, basically it would go back. But we could also just approve a higher amount for next year, right? Like we don't necessarily have to roll it over, quote unquote. I'm going to defer to the leadership in the room. <laughs> right. So two two separate things happening here. Any um, any budget allocation that isn't fully expended by year end would roll over, and then that's also calculated into our budgeting exercise for fiscal year 24. So we're engaging in a rigorous fiscal year 24 budget review process. And at, through that process, you'll be able to evaluate with the budget team and our projections, any rollover money, new revenues that are projected to come up with new amounts. So you may maintain the level, you could decrease the level, you can increase the level working with our financial experts on how much money we have overall. Sort of two separate things happening. Any money that aren't expended, go back into the pot, are available moving forward and the team's constantly evaluating that and you will be evaluating that too for FY24. So to answer the question specifically then, I'd, I'd be in favor of returning the excess beyond if we agree to do any additional funding here to the general fund and having a separate conversation around how much we want to allocate to mental health special service contracts for next fiscal year. Just feel like it's cleaner that way. So the, just so I understand that too. So you're saying Matt that if like Jeremy had this 23,500 would be left, then we would say, if we still want to do 120,000, then nope, not going to do any math here. 96,500 X. Nope. Nope. I'm not getting that right. It was 23 and a half additional. So 26. Yeah. I think it just sort of had it backwards. <laughs> any, any amount that you aren't allocating is ultimately going to go back into the general fund. Um, and that's just sort of revenue. That's going to be over, our overall expenditures. So an unallocated balance and the financial team packages that together every single year with new revenue and existing revenues and comes up with recommendations for you that you review. And as you've done over the past years, sometimes you'll ask for more in one area and less in another area. We're constantly balancing the scale. So any money you don't expend this year, presumably if it's ongoing revenue, is gonna be available in ongoing years. So you will be able to allocate and consider mental health funding in totality next year based upon past practices, based upon past allocations and otherwise. You'll be able to evaluate that almost new. The uh, the intent with this money, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it's expended before the end of the year. Yes. And that's having to do with the calendar. It's sort of this one-year contract. Sometimes we have four-year contracts. Other times we have two-year contracts. But this is this one-year contract to try to chew everything up. And so here's where we're running out of a little bit of time. I think in a perfect world, we would have said, hey, we'll come back to you. Let us come back in two or four weeks with, you know, review the information with the two liaisons again, but we're just flat out of time to be awarding money to grantees and then trying to them have them expend those uh, monies by June 30th, which is the end of our fiscal year. And yeah, well, I guess, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, mm -hmm. Um. Historically, CTC's used all their funding. They've they've had matching grants. They've mm -hmm. used funding from the county. Um, did they do they return money to anybody else, or was it just us, or were they the first one? You know, how did that work? Did they did they only use half their funding? And is 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 that even an appropriate question? But I'm just curious, like, what happened? Can I answer that? Please. Um, so they also returned return the same amount of funding to Summit County. So we were we were right there with the match for Summit County historically, if you saw from that staff report. So they received both, they were, are receiving both the same amount of funding back. And is there any anticipation that the, the costs that they have in this previous year are sort of the cost that they anticipate going forward? Did they reduce their services? Did um, they just banded? So they're done. Okay. Well, that, that explains it. And, and, you know, just to be fair to communities that care otherwise, you know, part of this bifurcated approach that we had, um, which was connected to the previous report and the staff communications, was uh, we had direction from council. We, we felt overall 
after this year, moving forward, even communities that care would compete through a competitive process like every other entity. And so um, irrespective of what's happening with communities that care in the interim in terms of you know, what's their future look like and otherwise, I think this fits either way. So I guess my question really is, 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 there, a, is there a big hole in the county now um, in terms of services being provided to those youth that need it? Um, because this was a very specific program that we brought in, we banded together with the county and the, and the school district, and we were trying to serve a particular population. And I'm, I'm concerned that that population is not being served. And by just trying to, and I understand we got to get the money out. There's a there's a timeline, but I just want us all to be really cognizant of that community and the specific need that we were trying to meet with communities that care. And I certainly hope that if we have people getting ready to come in for special service contracts, that we have people considering that community because I'm I'm concerned about that. Just the synopsis from Live Like Sam, that, you know, they're saying they thrive youth well-being and prevention program. The Thrive program is an initiative that empowers and strengthens youth well-being. So that one is part of kids. Is that what you're asking? Like a youth specific no, well, we, yeah. we we funded that communities that care after we had a couple really right. serious it it was it it was a very targeted program and live like Sam does a wonderful job of so many things, but it does not meet all those needs. And I'm just concerned about whether I've no I'm not yeah. an expert. I have I have kind of the same question as to whether we've touched base with the school district and the county as to how we want to collaboratively move forward, whether that needs still exist to collaboratively move forward, because the um, whole point of CTC was that it was this community wide, to your point, it was Wasatch back really. <clears throat> well, I don't know how much it included um, the Heber area, but it was really about all of Summit County, the school district and the city partnering to create a safety net for our youth. And it was, um, it wasn't, I know that there were parts of it that were about reaching out to other organizations, but it was kind of communities that care is the hub. And then there was also the mental health alliance going on. And I know that some of their jobs and roles got refined, but I really, um, I guess this is moving away from me having a question, but I really would feel more comfortable having an opportunity to touch base with those two entities and have a conversation about what we want to do collaboratively before we touch that money um but don't we, we need to do something but we can move forward the general fund, so it's like but we can move forward with the sixty thousand. i feel well i, I i'm going to say that before we get too far down the road um i'd like to open does anyone else have any questions okay then i i think we should probably take public input and then we can continue our discussion yeah that'd be great okay if anyone has any um input that they'd like to give please uh, step up to the podium and give your name and um, zip code. And uh, if anyone is online, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Does anyone want to give us any input? No hands raised. No hands raised. Anyone in the audience? Okay, well then let's continue our discussion. Okay. <laughs> Good facilitation there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, um, I guess my overall thought on this is I just want to make sure that um, it seemed like um, my understanding of the past was it's, it was a bigger amount kind of going for a single purpose, um, addressing a specific need. And, and so the number's big. And sometimes when you take a big number and slice it up and, and give it out, like you kind of, you're reducing the impact. You're not necessarily targeting it, you know, exactly um, like sort of the nut you're trying to crack. Um, and so, um, we, so we had the 60, this, the allocations make sense. Um, the remaining funds is where I'm a little bit squishy on, um, kind of to Becca's point, do we pull back those funds, have a more strategic conversation about, um, what is the gap? What's our role as a municipality? Um, and where should we point our funding? Cause you know, the money goes back in the general fund sort of this year, next year, it's, it's sort of immaterial. We just have the money to spend um, versus trying to dole out the remaining funds. It's, and it's sort of hard to answer that question, not having been on the committee. So I'd probably, um, you know, defer to, to 
those who heard the presentations and read the detailed material about how much these really address um, what we're trying to address with mental health. And so sort of to Jeremy's suggestion, I'd be comfortable with that if you um, if you think the applications were worthy of funding. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I think probably the big picture is we do need to circle back with the school district and the county and talk about who's serving those needs today, what's the gap, what's our role. I, mean, I agree with all that. I, no issue with it's kind of a separate item though right like the way i look at this is we're talking about this money in this fiscal year and these applicants for special service contracts that you know i just feel like we told the community we're putting one hundred twenty thousand dollars towards this and that we should award what makes sense from a qualified applicant perspective um, and since we are getting that money back that gives us the tools to you know try it out and this is new this year um, see how they do meeting the kpis that they promise right and, and their performance metrics there um, and if it works we'll probably do more of it and if it doesn't we'll probably make some changes and try it a different way um, and i'd also be 100 percent open to having the next conversation about the other topic on how do we partner with the school district and the county for the very specific um, question that's being asked and almost see that as a separate funding discussion also at this point, because we don't even know where that's gonna go. Yeah, and I, I think I, I would agree with most of that, but the, the thing that I, I think I'd prefer to hold the money that we just got back and have it in the general fund and know that we have sort of this little cushion. Um, the thing that we do by putting, the, by shoving it out right now is we kind of force, these organizations to spend it in a short period of time when we're only, you know, we're two, we're eight weeks away from maybe getting more applications and they might see these gaps apply and, and be able to fill the gaps that we're looking to fill with that money specifically. It was kind of dedicated for that. And it just gives us a little bit more time. It gives them time to dial in what the need in the community is. And I think this, that the current, funding strategy of, with $60,000 right now makes sense. Just considering the time crunch, I don't disagree with the logic, but I I think I'd rather have the money and, and maybe we can actually meet some more needs in the early part of next year with some targeted RFPs or whatever they are when they come in when or requests. So I think I'm gonna land on approving it as is putting the money in the general fund and, and, and moving forward that way. I ask you a question. So you said in May is when the next round goes up, starts, right? Uh, ideally, that's when we'd open the next application. That yeah. doesn't give us very much time to decide what we want. <laughs> we, ha we have a little bit of flexibility though, but it would just be a matter of communicating it with the applicants. Um, so right now that has been put out there. Um, if we wanted to go ex like a lot longer, that that would probably that would pose an issue. But we do have a little, we have some flexibility. But that's just what I'm I'm nervous about is mm -hmm. what are we? You know, this group is now. It seems like three of you have said that you want to put this money back into the general fund and get together with the county and the school in the next six weeks and figure this out. I mean, no, that's no, in the next year. The next year. Want. But you're saying for 2024. Uh, so this would just be the next round of the mental health funding so if we wanted to if we decide to take the return funds and put them in there that we could do that but it sounds like what i'm hearing is this is the the, the discussion around the returns fund would be held off the side and we'd approach that in due in time as needed and give that as much time whereas this, if i'm hearing this right the mental health special service contracts could still run mm -hmm. on their scheduled course yeah, yeah. it doesn't separate. really yeah. work like that does it well I mean, it, well actually so um, we can dedicate the money to go to the special service contracts and not have them fully decided by July 1st, but the money will be in a pot still. <laughs> but so, why so, wouldn't, I mean, if this but, is such a critical need, why wouldn't we just fund it for another well, 20, 25,000 to the qualified organizations? Well, I think that we did a really good job reviewing the, the applications and I feel very comfortable with the amounts that we designated or that we've allotted to each organization. Um, and I, I do think that to your point, like if you're going to pick amounts to give to each organization, even if we maybe had much more money, I feel very comfortable with those amounts that we we put in. Um, I do think also 
if you're going to speak to transparency that we said that we had sixty thousand dollars and to apply for these grants we didn't say we had 120,000 and maybe people would have applied for more or less or different amounts but i think we kind of were really clear we said we had 100 or sixty thousand dollars that we were going to put out um and asked you know organizations to apply for it i do think that we'd had a really good process reviewing it and i feel very comfortable with where we're at and i do think that there needs to be a bigger conversation about where we're going and what our strategy is to both matt and Ryan, uh, max's and ryan's point um one of the things that was really um that i really felt good about with um, the ctc funding was that it was 60 from the city 60 from the county leveraged to 240 with that match from the federal government and so it felt like we were giving a substantial amount of money towards accomplishment it didn't work out um but i would i think that you know we did have a review of the mental health strategic plan but it didn't feel to me as that it called out a good role for the city to participate in it was just kind of like we need all these things and so i would love to have an opportunity to have that revisited as to what the role of the city should be in addition to what the role of the county and the school district should be and are we collaborating are we working separately where should we be and i i think that <clears throat> you know you can throw a lot of money at things but if it's not really part of a bigger strategy then it doesn't feel like it's really us working towards something it's just if you ask for money we're going to give it to you so yeah maybe maybe if i could help it just sounds like there's two sorry ryan where are you gonna go um but it sounds like there's you know first of all there's a quality problem to have right we've got some extra resources here and it sounds like there's two different conversations the first conversation is you have the um, recommendation before you that was vetted by staff through an application process and then was vetted by the two liaisons you have a recommendation before you so you can not approve that you can approve that or you can approve that as amended and it sounds like you've had some discussion about that secondarily i think we're taking away some underlying direction throughout the budget process or otherwise about potential ways to renovate this process moving forward which is some type of a conversation between the schools uh, the county representatives and others about looking ahead and looking forward. But I would just encourage you like two very different conversations. But the second one is important to us and we're listening out loud that we think this is something we can improve, set up these meetings for you, support you in your li liaison roles moving forward. But I think you have the business item before you, which is this item as as is, as amended or not at all, if that helps. Yeah, right. Um, so I, I think the, the sort of net of it for me is if it, having heard, you know, the stuff that fell below the line of the sixty thousand dollars, if you'd come in with a budget of one twenty, um, communities that care has not has never happened. It's budgeted as budgeted. Would you have would you have funded these applications? And if you would have, then they met the bar and it clears the bar. And I think we should fund them a little bit. If it's these fell below the line for a reason, I don't want to fund them just to fund them. So that's, I guess that's the perspective I'm looking for from you having heard it. Yeah, well, I would have funded Big Brothers and Big Sisters and I would have funded more money to live like Sam. And I probably wouldn't have recommended that, so. Okay. <laughs> that's that's that makes it piece. Easy. Yeah. And, and therein, yeah, and therein perhaps lies the conflict with the, the way the procurement was set up. So that's why I think you consider the business item before you, so we can make a motion. Or then we've heard you loud and clear on the second part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I'll make a motion here to approve new business item two as amended to reflect um, the recommendation that we heard from one of the two liaisons, I suppose, <laughs> which would be to fund Big Brothers, Big Sisters additionally, and also to fund Live Like Sam at what level? Probably another, at least in a, probably another 10. That was what my thought was. That would go to, or you could do it mm -hmm. at the max of what this health in person benefit was, which was 15. Mm -hmm. what, so, do you have a preference? I think we should, could do 215. And okay, and to amend the funding for Live Like Sam to fifteen thousand, so it's an additional fifty five hundred plus seventy five hundred. So what's that? Thirteen thousand. So we're spending twenty two five or twenty seven five of the fifty. No, I, if we take that recommendation, then we'd be spending seventy three thousand total on the awards, right? Mm -hmm. I thought we had sixty plus. I thought it was sixty plus fifteen more for Live Like Sam and. No, 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 no. No, up to 15 because the other oh up to 15. 15. gotcha so that's the most five five 
Do you want me to restate it, uh, simplify it? Please. Right. So I'll make a motion to approve new business item two with the following amendments. Funding Big Brothers Big Sisters at $7,500 and funding Live Like Sam at a total of $15,000, which is an increase of $5,500 from the recommendation. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Um, motion passes. Um, I would like to ask, though, that when the mental health um, so special service contracts come back around that we have a discussion about putting some guide rails in about, um, <clears throat> you know, number of years that we fund it similar to what we do with the special service contracts, because I can already feel that there might just be things where people just start applying every year and you get kind of stuck in that rut, funding things at one level and not having any flexibility. So maybe there's an opportunity to have a discussion about um, putting some something in like we do with special service contracts where it's used for a pilot um, or temporary funding, but it's not something that we'll fund every year in perpetuity. Yes, loud and clear. Cool, so okay. new new business item was was approved as amended. And uh -huh. then I think for from our perspective from staff, just begin working with the liaisons. There's no reason to delay. I, I, just, I see no reason to delay. So as soon as we can get that going, the better. Yep, we can do that. Great, thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, so we are moving on to um, new business item number three, or yes, new business item number three, consideration to approve ordinance 2023-13 and ordinance amending Title V, Government Records Access Management Act, Chapters 1 and 2 of the Municipal Code of Park City. Hi, council members. If it's okay, I'll mm -hmm. handle this item from here. Um, this is a request or a recommendation to clean up Title V of the Municipal Code. The Government Access Records and Management Act, which we all call GRAMA, um, was adopted in 1992. And when Park City um, adopted its Municipal Code, as we've seen in other instances, it pulled a lot of state law directly into the Municipal Code. One of the problems with doing that is um, when you don't pull all of it in, what does that mean? And when there are changes, and even if they're simply sort of little word changes here and there, even though our city code often says, you know, Utah Code 63G2101 as amended, somebody reading the code might not think to go cross-reference it, right? So our recommendation really, um, now that codes are electronically available, they're online, there's no charge, they're easy to find, there's really... Um, less and less need to duplicate state law into city code. So this proposed resolution does two things. It gets rid of outdated code language, which hasn't been you know, amended when the legislature tinkers with grandma, which it does on a pretty regular basis. Um, but more importantly, what we're recommending is eliminating an additional discretionary level of appeal. So under the Government Records Access and Management Act, if, a, if the city denies a request, um, because the information is protected or um, controlled or meets one of the other non-public categories, the requester has a right to appeal that denial. So anytime we don't provide something for because it's private or one of the other categories, the denial letter specifically says it's denied because, and then it cites the code provision that makes that record non-public. And as I say in the staff report, there's over 150 categories of non-public records. And so um, that's why the, the code specifically requires us to say denied because. So we cite the code and then we give a um, appeals information. The chief administrative officer is the term in the code and by Park City Municipal Code, that's the city manager, which is working well. So if uh, we deny a record and the requester would like to appeal, the appeal goes to the city manager. Currently, if the city manager upholds the denial of the record, that requester needs to go to this level of appeal board that's currently in city code, um, which frankly hasn't been invoked in anyone's memory that I have talked to. Um, so what we've got is an appeals board on the books that hasn't been invoked that would need to be pulled together, educated, consider this, 
before the person can take, and if that um, appeals board also affirms the denial, then the requester has to go either to the state records committee or file a petition for review in district court. And so what I have seen over the course of my career is a lot of municipalities adopted these appeals boards in the early 90s. Um, the state records committee was not nearly so robust. It was a very different animal at that time. Things have changed a lot in the intervening years. And many local governments, and certainly the ones that I've uh, discussed this with, with, have gotten rid of the discretionary level of review because it's cumbersome for requesters the state records committee is up and running. It's a well-oiled machine. It's represented by the attorney general's office. They've got a robust um, repository of all of their opinions online. It's just a better mechanism and it's frankly quicker and probably more transparent than the city pulling together an ad hoc committee and trying to bring them up to speed to hear an appeal of a denial. So our recommendation is that we eliminate that discretionary level of appeal that, like I say, hasn't been invoked to anyone's knowledge. But grandma, um, you know, is important. It's about transparency. It's about the public's, the city's work on the public's business on behalf of the public. And if something is denied, I mean, remember that just because a record is non-public, that doesn't mean the city automatically says denied, right? We still have to do that constitutional balancing test and determine whether the public interest in the record outweighs any privacy interest. So it's not just a rote exercise of this is a non-public record, therefore we deny, we still have to do the balancing test. But if there is a denial and there is an appeal, again, we recommend eliminating this discretionary level of review. And that's what this code amendment does. But happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Sure. So um, just to make sure I'm understanding it clearly, if I if I break this all down, it would seem to me that to expedite the process of a twice denied appeal, it might be faster now that the now that the state records committee is up and running and it's a robust operation, that that denial would be seen there sooner than if we were to try and build a committee, educate that committee. Um, to see a twice denied appeal, um, it would seem to me that we might actually expedite the process of a con to get to a conclusion by eliminating this extra bureaucratic step. I want to be careful with saying that it would get to the state records committee sooner mm -hmm. because the, there are timelines set out for both levels. Um, it would certainly be a more transparent and I would argue more robust process to go to the state records committee. And I, sh I should just say, I speak from experience. Salt Lake City had this discretionary level of appeals board during the time when I was there. And, you know, unfortunately I litigated different issues with that board, one case to the court of appeals and one case to the Utah Supreme Court. It, it was a, it was a clunky, um, frustrating for the public and hard for staff to administer board for a variety of reasons. Whereas, like I say, the state records committee, it, it really is a well-oiled machine. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that really is a big part of our recommendation. And we didn't want this lingering on the books because it's inevitable that someone is going to appeal. Um, if, if a denial is appealed to the city manager, you know, often those don't get appealed because the city manager reviews it and maybe does the balancing test a little differently, or maybe their the request wasn't as clear, right? And so often we do end up providing maybe slightly more records or the city manager is able to explain a little more thoroughly, this is why you didn't get it. And and it hasn't been pushed beyond that. But, but I think that it's not unreasonable to expect that that's coming. And we just didn't want something outdated on the books that um, was frustrating for for the requesters. I just have, so the state records committee, this is what they do, right? Yes. Okay, thank yep. you. This is all they do is hear appeals hear and appeal. denials. So of they records. are just very professional at this. Yep, already. and they're, they're, um, they hear appeals from around the state. Many of them have been doing it for a long time, but there is a, you know, it's a statutory board. It's a, it's a public body. All right, do we have any, um, 
is this open for a public hearing? Um, if, does anyone want to step up and give any uh, comment on this item? I don't know, do we have any hands raised online? We do not. All right. Any uh, comments or a motion? Your Honor, I move we approve new business item number three. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item passes. Motion passes. But <laughs> 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 yeah. we're almost done. Oh, sure. We have one more item. Oh, oh I thought Max had to go to the bathroom for, for 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we will move on now to new business item number four, consideration of a city policy for the use of city flagpoles, buildings, and resolutions for government expression. Oh. <laughs> Just getting our slideshow up here. Share my screen. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Sarah Pierce, Deputy City Manager. I'm joined by Luke Henry. City. Assistant City Attorney. Um, and we are here tonight to talk to you about government speech. Um, down here. So the Park City government expresses itself in a number of ways. This type of expression is commonly referred to as government speech. And we are kind of focusing in on three particular areas um, of government speech, resolutions, flags on city light poles, and lighting city buildings. Turn it over again. So the general rule for all of this is pretty simple. When you all are speaking or expressing yourselves as the government, uh, as like the city, you can say whatever you want. You can decide which messages to convey and which to avoid. Um, but the First Amendment still has a role to play when the government makes venues available for public expression. And issues can occur when the government thinks it is speaking, but has unintentionally opened a forum for public, for the public to express itself. Um, there's sort of two poles here that we're talking about. The government as the speaker, that, that's generally fine. And on the other side, where the government has, is operating as a, sort of a speech facilitator, um, and that's where you have First Amendment issues can come in. So that is what happened in Boston. So Boston has three flagpoles in front of its city hall. Uh, individuals or groups could request to replace the city flag with another flag for a limited time. A city employee would review the request to ensure the flag was consistent with the city's message, policies, and practices. Uh, over a 12-year period, Boston approved 284 flag-raising events and did not deny a single request. Then Camp Constitution filed a request to fly a Christian flag, the flag shown on the screen here. Uh, Boston denied the request because it did not want to fly a religious flag. It also maybe thought that it wasn't allowed to. Um, Camp Constitution filed a lawsuit that made its way all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which held that the flagpole was not government speech. The use of the flagpole was not government speech. Boston hadn't maintained sufficient control over that. And so the court held that the flagpole was being used to facilitate public speech. So the First Amendment applied and Boston had illegally denied the request to fly the Christian flag. Um, so Camp Constitution was allowed to fly their flag. Uh, and then the Satanic Temple came in and requested that their flag also be allowed to fly. Um, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Um, okay, so as I said earlier, three areas of focus. Um, the first one is resolutions, and this is probably, you know, the biggest area to focus on and, and kind of the most encompassing um, 
approximately half of the resolutions that come to city council and are adopted by city council in the last five years have been um, what we're calling message resolutions requested from outside parties. And these are, you know, really heartfelt, good organizations doing really great work in the community. Um, we've had a number of them, Parkinson's, Pride, Children's Dental Health Month. I mean, there's a, a runs the gamut. Um, we care about these organizations. We want to celebrate them. Um, but it's it's different than the resolutions that you also pass that are to enact policy, such as the previous council meeting, we enacted a, a procurement rules or the fire ban, for example. So currently these resolutions requested by outside parties have no formal vetting process. Um, the recommendation is to stop allowing, um, stop accepting outside resolutions on council meeting agendas. Because when you agendize these resolutions, they become government speech. Um, council members could continue to support causes through council comments and the public can celebrate causes during public comment. I just have two more slides, then we'll be at the end and we can discuss. Um, flags. So currently there, we do have an administrative policy that only allows for the feet of government flags to be flown on city owned flagpoles. This policy has not been strictly followed. The recommendation is to follow the current policy because flags are government speech. And then the lighting of city buildings, we do not have an administrative policy for lighting city buildings. Um, the recommendation is to not light city buildings for expressive messages. And this one actually comes with some additional considerations, which it, you know, got the dark skies ordinance. There's also budget and staff resource um, implications. So, you know, as we go forward with, we start thinking about how we want to move forward with these kind of conversations. We want to take that into consideration as well. So that's really it for our presentation. And we just wanted to open the discussion and see what kind of questions you have. All right. Uh, Council, do you have any questions? Yeah, let's go on. Uh, did you want to go ahead? Uh -huh. no. So it, it sounds like the flags question is related to what is classified as government speech right and then through resolutions that's how we could classify something as government speech or recognize it as government speech i don't know the right words yeah so i think you could use resolutions to clearly state your intent like if you want to fly something different on a flagpole you could use a resolution to make it clear that that is the government speaking through the flag on the flagpole does that answer okay. your question yeah yeah it does and this is a policy that we could change whenever I mean, is this just up to council? Yes, our recommendation is yes, yeah, sort of based on administering it. But yeah, it's up to you guys how you want to uh, get resolutions to you and what you want to do with those. So has any thought been put to how we could manage a process where we vet requests for basically resolutions slash government speech? So one idea we did um, discuss internally is, I'll use an example of a community member could approach one of you um, and request to have a flag flown or to have a resolution read at a council meeting. You could then take it to the mayor um, and get a quorum of council to agree to have it put on the agenda. And then you would adopt that resolution or, you know, that, that cause would be part, it, it, it had, excuse me, uh, you would have a quorum of council that allowed it to be on the agenda. Margaret can help it, me. Just let me <laughs> clear up. No, I, I think you're just mixing up two yeah. words. Um, you, if a, if a council member were approached with the idea to adopt a resolution that could include, for instance, flying a flag concurrently, then um, whatever the process is, whether it goes to the mayor or the mayor pro tem, but ultimately the recommendation would probably be talk to your colleagues. And if there are three council members, which is a majority who are interested in it being agendized, then it gets on the agenda for your consideration and potential adoption. So it's two steps. How does it get on the agenda? 
and whether or not a majority vote to approve it. Mm -hmm. But the reason that we're recommending, you know, there's got to be some gatekeeper for what gets on a, a resolution because obviously city council resolutions aren't generated by who talks to, you know, Max in the grocery store and Matt at the mark or whatever. So we want to keep that a little tighter. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that answers. So our, is how we spend money eventually going to fa fall into a bucket of of speech? Be, you know, we just went through special service contracts. Are we uh, are we getting into a, a territory where we may be questioned on every? I don't know. Is how you spend money speech? I I don't know. I think it has been in certain cases and has not in others. And and are we getting way too in the weeds here, or is this like national stuff? The government can say whatever it wants, and so if it is speech, it's fine. If it's not speech, it's also fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right are there any other questions i just have a qu i just just to clarify so the public is aware these are not the flags that are on main street that whole process to put up flags on main street is different can you those are just, banners or ban yeah so we banners. call those light pole banners um and those are um installed along with a special event permit so it's a totally separate policy and procedure so we, yeah, we're not touching that at all. And that would, okay, thank you. I have a question. Why, why does there need to be a vetting process before a resolution is considered? Because resolutions are voted on, right? So how could they become uh, public speech since we're voting on the resolutions? Yeah, I think, I think passing the resolution, it, it clearly at that point transforms into government speech. We're sort of worried about the step before that of getting things on the agenda. Uh, if there's no gatekeeping function happening and every member of the public that approaches the city and says, I want this thing to be heard by city council, we don't want to have 20 resolutions on a council agenda where any group can say whatever they want in a resolution and then you guys discuss it and decide to vote it down. But it's still, it's giving it a forum. That that's, that's, the, that's the key is that you're, by letting anyone request it and it goes on an agenda, you're sort of opening up a forum. Well, what do we do now? So, yeah, so that's, yeah. that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're. That's why so we're you're just saying we we get too many resolutions. <laughs> no, I mean, I I guess I'm just a little confused. Like, isn't that just open speech? So, Matt, uh, city manager, this process has evolved over the years. Typically, the city recorder and myself and the mayor are doing our best to to vet these. Mm -hmm. I think what we see about the, the favorable outcome about having better process up front is um, Michelle or myself or the mayor isn't sort of getting between an interest group, an individual, um, or any other entity and the rest of council. Um, there are times when something's come before us and we said, does this really qualify? Is there another way? So I think this helps us by having some cohesion prior to making it to the agenda, a better process. That That's definitely going to be helpful from our end. And I know that Michelle and I are looking forward to that, that we have a little bit more sustenance with how we're moving these to the agenda or not to the agenda. I mean, I just, I think the fear is that someday someone's going to accuse us of being arbitrary or capricious or, or, or having some type of bias and, and we don't want that. So here, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that, that makes, sorry, I think that makes sense mm -hmm. um, versus simply not having resolutions, just implementing some process. I mean, if, even is it a process, it just don't want to overload bureaucracy on this, right? I mean, even if that's a duty of the mayor pro tem mm -hmm. to weigh in on resolutions or um, with, with the mayor as the mayor sets the agenda, just to keep it simple because we're, mm -hmm. we're we're working on a problem that we don't have today right so we just mm -hmm. need some process yeah, yeah so we just need some process mm -hmm. to address it but we don't need extensive process to, to mm -hmm. solve the that's problem. the line we've tried to blend yeah okay yeah the reason we are recommending a quorum is because then it's clearly the city speak like a quorum of you forms mm -hmm. the city speaking uh, the mayor doesn't necessarily do that if it's just the mayor reviewing mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. agendas and so a quorum is, I think, a little more protective. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and these things often aren't issues point. until someone applies and we are like, no, we don't want that. And we haven't set any sort of process before that, then mm -hmm. then we have an issue. It creates a vetting process. Jeremy had one more question and then let's open up for public comment. Yeah, just to clarify this a bit, because when I'm hearing you describe this, it doesn't sound dissimilar at all to the process we use if 
council wants to get anything on an agenda, right? Like we, we always poll council and see if there's majority support for, from a quorum. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm having a hard time because to me, it feels like it would be consistent to say, we're going to follow it the same kind of process. It might not be in the official setting, but. Uh, well, I think they could come in and make a public comment. And it's a little bit different, uh, just in that, um, you know, typically this is an outside entity that's probing counsel mm -hmm. to bring something to your public agenda, whereas often the other items, it's something that's in, of interest to you at a policy level. It's a contractual maneuver or it's a logistical or ordering equipment, supplies, things like that. So this is a little bit different about a third party interplaying with your public agenda. A little different than you bringing an item to me saying, hey, Matt, you know, can we talk about the parking garage next week because we've got some concerns with rates or otherwise. It's a little bit Picturing more direct. a Venn diagram where it's almost a circle. <laughs> like it's pretty close. It's a little different. I get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I Back just had a, let's not. I just had a question. Um, the city recorder called different places in Salt Lake. So for Cottonwood Heights, they require approval of the mayor and at least one other council member for the item to be on the agenda. Um, and then four members for West Valley. But how do they get to these people? Like, that's what I'm a little bit confused. So would you say like, they, you tell the public, like email everybody on council and see who jumps in? Like, I mean, I, I just don't understand where that process No, I think it could be as simple as, you know, to, to Matt's point, like you ran into somebody at the library and they said, hey, we wanna, you know, do a resolution on a great cause. And you say, great, I'll take it back to the mayor and. Mm -hmm. and, and my other council members and see um, if they'd like to put it on the agenda. But I just, this is where I'm, I'm like trying to make sure free speech happens for the council. If someone approaches me and I don't like what they're saying and I just ignore it mm -hmm. and I don't take it to council, then I'm not doing a free speech job, correct? No. No, so you need, so they, go they need to go to back. Somebody else. It, it, it doesn't make it incumbent upon council members I just don't want to be representing the entire council. Right. Like if I like green, but Jeremy likes pink or something, right. you know. Like, and that's why we would recommend a process that potentially could, if council wants to adopt resolutions as government speech, you know, continuing on with a little more robust process than has existed, you can certainly choose to do that. And we would just recommend outlining a process, which is requests they can, they could come to the city recorder who will get them to the mayor who will check in and see if there are three council members who support putting it on agenda. They could run through the mm -hmm. mayor and the mayor pro tem who could check in with one other council member each. I mean, it, but it doesn't again, make it incumbent on any council member to forward a request and isolation. I just a basic question to you, going back into our history books, why do we have resolutions? Because how else are we going to mark the start of winter? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> That's my main yeah. concern. Sorry. No, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Why? What do they do? Yeah. So uh, under state law, um, governing bodies have really have two mechanisms <laughs> to act, and that's ordinance or resolution. Okay. Resolutions often have a substantive policy basis, like Sarah and Luke mentioned, right? The procurement rules and the fire ban are substantive policy based or the fee schedule for instance is adopted by resolution so council acts in two ways ordinance and resolution resolutions are generally policy more policy than general applicable law which is what ordinances are but many governments throughout the united states also adopt proclamations or resolutions proclamations are often used to recognize retiring employees who have served the city loyally for 35 years. Proclamations could also be used to recognize, you know, Library Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. If the council's doing it on the council's own volition, then that's still government speech. The title of the document, proclamation, resolution, declaration, doesn't change the First Amendment analysis that Luke laid out. Mm -hmm. So how did we come to do this? I think it's because you know, local government bodies get requests to celebrate things that community members are doing and resolutions, you know, supporting um, Parkinson's Awareness Month is one way to do that. Lots of cities don't do them. Mm -hmm. It runs the gamut. Like for winter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the winter thing is, is, was new to me when I started here. 
Well, a lot of a lot of cities use them much more narrowly um, to to be locale specific, but not necessarily take on others' celebrations because they can always come to public comment, or one of you could read a resolution during council comments and say, "I'm just really excited about Marshmallow." Monday, and I wanted to share this with you. So there's all sorts of different ways it could be handled, but this is not atypical. Mm -hmm. And but then even so, if we just said we're not going to do any more proclamations, it doesn't prohibit us from being saying, you know, I'd like to recognize um, Pride Month. I'd like to celebrate uh, this month and acknowledge all the great work going on in our community and all the organizations. And it doesn't also prohibit the community from getting up and saying something and saying we want you to recognize this with us and we want to celebrate and do these things it just says that we are no longer going to have a resolution proclaiming it Very good. And okay. by virtue then it's not government speech though right mm -hmm. unless yeah. there's it's just a personal it's just a it's just us recognizing it's right it's individual elected officials wearing the you guys keep your first i mean former aclu lawyer here right you keep your First Amendment rights as an individual and also as an elected official, and it only transforms to government speech when you vote on a resolution as, you know, a proclamation or a resolution adopted by the Council of Park City. All right. So with that, um, so this one says it's a public hearing, but we're not taking action on this tonight. Is that correct? We just, we just love to, get, to just get a little bit of direction okay. um, if you're interested in some kind of a vetting process, you know, we'd love to get that, but. All right, let's do the public in. hearing then in here. Um, if anyone would like to get up and um, provide some public comment, please get up and state your name and your zip code, please. Hello, Council. Uh, my name is Joe Urankar, 84098. Um, this conversation has ranged a couple different points of view. So I just wanted to come and speak as representative of the LGBTQ task force that has um, received quite a bit of benefit from resolutions, flag raisings, and had ideas about building lighting and all, and all of that. Um, and we as an organization, I, and I really mostly want to speak to the value of resolutions and, and advocate for keeping them because we as a task force, our very first move um in, in getting to where we are now was a council resolution and and the act of having to, to put a coalition together of having to interact with city hall in a new way that that goal and that benchmark as a first step was really valuable to us and it really brought us together and formed the basis from which our task force grew and it created a layer of visibility that we wouldn't have otherwise had but there are so many minority groups and um, others that just don't have the social infrastructure to be heard outside of their immediate social sphere. So, so as a community, with these resolutions and, and other measures have an opportunity to elevate voices and things that do fit within the values of who we are. Um, so and thank you for the discussion that you've had here that talked about keeping them. Um, I mean, it sounds like we've gone back and forth. I'm not sure if we're still on the staff recommendation of just not doing it or continuing them. But if there is a public process um, that's robust enough that protects the city, but then also allows you to continue, I think this is a really valuable tool for our community and one that should continue. Good evening, everyone. My name is Insa Rieben, zip code 84060. I have heard you mentioning Parkinson's three times tonight. Thank you for that. Last year I was here when with the help of Michelle and Nan, I asked, how does this work? How can I get recognition for this new disease that I have? It seems to be quite prevalent and nobody really talks about it. So with the help of Michelle, who did all the work, I'm sure, <laughs> I was able to stand here and say uh, and present with a couple of people last year, Dr. Hamilton Easter, who is, cannot be with me here tonight because he's not well, um, as well as uh, a widow of a person who had Parkinson's. I cannot tell you how important your resolution that you gave to us was 
and I want to thank you for it again and again. If it's as easy as me talking to Jeremy and then saying, Ryan, you know, can you just do something in this and so cost? Government speak, I don't do. I can speak several other languages, but not government speak. <laughs> uh, it is important that we that you remain you remain approachable. Don't make it any di more difficult than it is. I have gotten into studies because of your your piece of paper. I am uh, last year. I said jokingly, um, I got the city. I'm going to go to the county next year. I'm there. I'm going to be talking to the health department as well as to county council all based on your piece of paper. So it was valuable. It is important to be able to, for me to, in this big little town, to approach you and say, what can I do? So I appreciate what you have done in the past and I hope you continue. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joel Zero. I'm 84060. Um, first, thank you for your service. I didn't know that I was going to come up and give public comment, um, especially on this matter, but I thought it was an agenda item. And I encourage this council, as you are doing, not to shy away from values based conversations. I think everything that you're doing, making policy, is a, is a values statement, developing a budget and allocating resources is a statement of values. And so I think it's a, a core part of what it means uh, to be a government leader is represent the polis, politic, and help lead us in clarifying what are the values of the community and lead us forward. Um, I go back 100, 200 years, and I reflect on what were the values of the community then and where are we now? And I would say that through public discourse, and it can get really messy sometimes, clarifying the values of who we are as a community, who we want to be, who we aspire to, is a core function. Whether it's represented through lighting or through flagpoles or through resolutions, they're all valuable statements of who we are and who we want to be. And so thank you for taking on this conversation, and I encourage you to keep leading us. Thank you. Is there anyone online? There is. We have Peter Tomai. All right, let's pull him up. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Peter Tomai. I live in 84098. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I'd like to echo a little bit of what the former speaker just said. But keep, you know, and and to emphasize that leadership is is taking a stand on items that are important to us, um, whether it be sustainability or or various causes and interests. And I hope that the process does not. I think it's important to have a vetting process so that there is a predictable process by which we go through to determine what's going to constitute government speech, so to speak. Um, but, but I hope the process does not get so um, so protracted that it causes us to become sterile with um, with no avenue for for expression. Um, because these these types of things, whether and in many cases it's celebrating joy or success, but I, I think it's very important that the that the city, can take a stand and celebrate um, a particular cause of its of importance or a goal or an aspiration. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No more hands raised. All right. Final comments. We didn't. Um, oh, sorry. We oh. do have one. One more hand. Chris okay. Campbell. Uh, hello. Thanks. Um, sorry, I was a little slow with raising my hands. Uh, I appreciate having this discussion because I think having some 
some clarity in what the process is helps people understand the nature of the speech that's going on and um, and how the community can participate in that. You know, uh, and so referred to um, oh my zip code by the way is eight four zero nine eight. Right, I'll get there eventually. Uh, you know, Insa talked about how when she came up uh, last time that she wasn't quite sure of the process about how to get these sorts of things. So I think if we can clarify a little bit about the nature of the the speech that's made through prop through proclamations and flag raisings, and I think if we can make you know a lightweight process so people just understand, and that helps alleviate concerns about whether or not things are fair, um, but to do it in a way that doesn't you know, privilege access, if I need to know where Jeremy does his grocery shopping and at what time so that I can make mm -hmm. sure to uh, bump into him at the appropriate time to get on the agenda, <laughs> that may or may not make things um, more complicated. So, you know, I would encourage a lightweight um, approach there. But I think it's okay to clarify that the nature of these proclamations are government speech and not free speech. And, um, you know, the, the San Jose flag racing policy was cited, I think, in Boston cases. Uh, as an example of a kind of policy that would be appropriate. And it just says that the flag raising is the government. Um, uh, flag raising of non-government flags can be done as part of a proclamation voted on by city council. So I think there's approaches like that that can help to clarify that the speech is, is related to the, the council speech. So uh, thank you for for your continued uh, consideration and looking looking for ways to, to find a reasonable approach to Thanks, Chris. No more hands, reason. All right, no more hands. Is there anyone else in house? Okay. Um, did we? Do we need? To, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm closing the public hearing. Here's a fun one. What does the county do? They, they mostly do proclamations, mostly to honor uh, employees and sounds like seldom do message res resolutions or proclamations, but do occasionally. I didn't get an example out of that. Okay. But they don't, they, they don't have a flag policy or, uh, okay, just, just checking. Um, yeah, so you're looking for direction. I think you guys kind of have it figured out. I think it makes sense to have some sort of policy in place just to protect ourselves from arbitrary decision making. That's what it sounds like this is about. It's not about making things more difficult or less difficult. We already do most of these things. We're just formalizing it a little bit. And um, to me, that makes sense just from a, the perspective of protecting ourselves against arbitrary decision making. That said, I get really bummed out, right? That we're just like, these types of things are reactions to the extremes in the world, to the tails on the bell curve, as Tim Henney used to talk about. And, mm -hmm. you know, everything in the middle is talking, you know, talking about welcoming winter and, and really like small town community based support for certain communities that need it. Not, it's not about aggressively being in your face um, and trying to offend people, which is, is essentially what we saw in your presentation is if you're going to support one thing, then we get to be supported on our offensive message. And we have to protect ourselves against that type of hate. And I understand that. It's just super disheartening to think that that's where we're getting to is that it that we may have to build in layers to do the good work that we've been doing for so long. And I just want to make sure that we as a community always feel comfortable stepping up and speaking out and supporting people who need it. And I mean, we lit the barn blue for nurses during the pandemic. That's, I'm sorry, but that's just, that's what they needed at the moment. They were driving by it on their way to work every day to try and take care of people. They're freaked out. Um, the fact that that is becoming more difficult is incredibly disheartening, not just in Park City, but everywhere. That's the kind of thing that just breaks hearts. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 
good comments. I agree with the, stat, the recommendation on flagpoles and lighting to maintain the status quo government speech. And uh, and, to, and uh, I think we should retain resolutions, but um, put some process around them to the mm -hmm. recommendation. And that would be my feedback. So um, can, just to clarify, what was your thought on the flagpoles? Because um, the policy currently doesn't allow us to um, hang other flags, but we have been doing it against our policy. Would you, uh, do you want us to revise our policy? No, keep, keep the current policy and just follow it. Same with lighting, just, okay. just the current policy. Um, but retain resolutions with some process. Okay. Dan and Jeremy, where are you guys at? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Ryan. I'm, I still just don't know what our process would be. Um, and, and do you guys need to know that if we're talking about resolutions? Cause, um, they can come up with a process that I think we'll we can come up with something that is not, is it like okay, to so, a grocery store? We could come up with a, you know, send an email to this person, maybe it's Michelle, a city reporter, and then she takes it from there and distributes it and well, gets, I mean, it, here. yeah, remember, this Google. is a part time job. So I don't want to get hit up at the grocery store all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, that, that's, that's what I'm just trying to think of is like, that's a really hard thing to say to the public is find your city councilor at no, that's what I'm saying. Well, we, we'll, we'll like come our, up with our an email and, and come up put it out there. We can put it on our website, I'm explain it to people, and you know, have a have a full transparent yeah. process so people know how to how to. Yeah, I mean, it's I think probably going to end up being more clear than it has been, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just think we used bad examples we did, today, right? Because <laughs> that's that's not what we're saying. We're saying like you would email someone and say, "Can I speak to you about this?" or or something like that. Not like you really have to go stalk the counselors. <laughs> um, so so I would I would like to see what you guys come up with with that. Um, I don't want to get rid of them, um, but I I do want to make it, you know, make a, a solid process around it that. Um, that doesn't, as, as Matt said, you know, protects us going forward. So we make sure that it remains government speech with the council's approval there. So, um, and um, I would like us to keep our, yeah, our current position on flagpoles and city buildings as well. All right, okay. I'll go for it. Um, so the only question I have first on the flagpoles it says our current policy is seats of government that's also different than government speech mm -hmm. question mark state no I mean the way we administer the current policy I think it would we have a procedure public groups don't come in and request as far as I know for the flagpole to change and so I think we can use it for seats of government flags with city manager approval. I think that continues to be government speech. We haven't opened that up as a, a forum for the public to come in and request to change those. So let me ask maybe differently. I, so if we approve a resolution in theory and it's through the official process, so it's considered government speech, does our current flag policy then allow a flag related to that now approved government speech to be flown or would it still be no because it says seats of government the current policy is an administrative policy and so you could override that so if you passed a resolution saying you wanted to fly a different flag i think that would be acceptable okay all right that works mm -hmm. um yeah so check that box fine with the flags and lighting policies um you know i, I agree with your comments max mm -hmm. what i just hear in the back of my head is offensive to who right and some stuff it's easy to look at and say like this doesn't fit our community and that's where i think as a council whoever's in these seats when these things come up at some point in the future because inevitably they will and i think the staff's proper in in raising this as a proactive measure um, we have to have the courage to say no also right i mean that's what a lot of this comes down to so not losing the good stuff because we're scared of the bad stuff totally agree that's that's a bad reason to tighten up as much as this looked like it was at, at first um and i you know to that note absolutely support continuing with the ability to pass resolutions 
Um, and personally, I like the process that was outlined where it takes a quorum to get it on the agenda and then we consider it as an official act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just going to be clear. A quorum, a quorum, quorum implies that you're going to get together and discuss it in a properly noticed open and public meeting. I think what you mean is a majority, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Thank that you. is. What so I just want to make sure we're. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say way worse things, I promise. Yeah, no, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what I mean. A majority of council gets it on the. If, if that's. If a majority of you want that, we could add that to the council protocols, which already talk about how items get on an agenda. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a that's a guiding document. It wouldn't need to come back to you. We're happy to do that. Or if you want to talk about it some more, we're also happy to come back. I think we should talk. That does not make a big move without Nan here in terms of how things get on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wait for her to be around for that conversation. Well, actually, so I guess what you're saying, though, though, to some degree that this is on our agenda and we can say we just want this item to be added to our protocols our city council protocols that um, we want to be able to have a proclamation put on the agenda if a majority of us are in favor and it's not a major change it's just clarifying a process and then you guys can Sam, go with this but what i heard you say is something about it takes a majority to get an item on an agenda. I don't want it to, to get a message resolution. There we go. Become government. Yeah. There we go. I just becoming... didn't want it to be yeah. confused. Be able to talk that way before. Mm -mm. And I think I got a little confused because West Valley says four members of council, but I bet they have a bigger council than we do. So when I looked at that, I thought four, but they probably have a seven member council. So it wouldn't have been a quorum. Is that right? Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, I really appreciate having this conversation tonight because I do think that it shows again that, you know, our words matter and it's important for our most vulnerable residents to hear that we support them and that we see them and um, we recognize and, and support them and here in our community. So um, I think that it makes a lot of sense having a way to have resolutions moving forward, but having this vetting process and having a really clear process that so that people know how to get in front of us and how to how to have this conversation. Um, and I, as long as there is an opportunity that we can, um, I forgot what the wording you used was, but we could pass it through a resolution that we could adjust the flag policy for, for certain circumstances. Okay, I feel very comfortable with all of that. Yeah, I agree. Even though, yep. yeah. And thank you to everyone who came and shared the reasons why that it's important for them to be able to have have these proclamations. I think it was really powerful to hear from you. Um, and with that, do you guys have the direction you need? Yes. Then uh, we, I'm not going to say that. We we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>